You're listening to CFRN, a community of believers who trade for a living. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and how we do it, call toll-free 1-866-928-3310, and we'll send you out a no-obligation information kit absolutely free. 866-928-3310. The CFRN E-Mini Futures Cast is now on Stitcher. Listen to us on your iPhone, Android phones, BlackBerry, and WebOS phone. Stitcher is smart radio for your phone. Find it in your app store or at Stitcher.com. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Are you ready, Steve? Uh Uh-huh. Andy? Yeah! Bert? Well, all right, fellas. Let's go! You're listening to CFRN, the Christian Financial Radio Network. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. Over 85,000 titles. Choose from mystery, romance, religion, science, technology, business, New York Times bestsellers, even children's books. You name it, Audible has it. With 85,000 titles to choose from, you're sure to find the perfect audiobook for yourself or to give as a gift, and it's absolutely free. Just point your browser to audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. That's audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. And become a part of the audiobook revolution by downloading your free audiobook today. audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. Hey, trainer, want to get rich quick? Well, good luck with that. If, on the other hand, you actually want to learn how to trade, the place to be is www.cfrn.net. Tune in Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern, for our daily devotional, and then spend the next three hours learning how it's done from professional traders who actually trade for a living. That's www.cfrn.net. Every trading day from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. CFRN, a community of believers who trade for a living. Good afternoon, traders, and welcome back to the CFRN E-Mini Futures Cast. This is the daily broadcast of Indeterminate Length, where we discuss all things E-Mini, along with some really big ideas on the finer points of trading gold, bonds, crude, sugar, the euro, and even T-bills. Joining us today from our studios in Boston, Mr. Michael Borg. From our trading desk in Chicago, Mr. Burton Schlichter. And from our studios in Las Vegas, Nevada, Mr. David Williams. Now, to get things started, let's go to our host and founder in Studio A, overlooking South Mountain, America's largest city park. Here's Dwayne. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Today is Tuesday, 18th day of August 2015. Let's take a quick look at the numbers. Go to the U.S. markets first. The, now, these are cash markets. The Dow is down 17 points. S&P down almost 4. NASDAQ down 15. And the Russell down 7.5. Crude oil is up 30 cents a barrel. Gold is down $2.50. Asian markets, nothing but red. The Nikkei down 65, Shanghai down 244, Hang Seng down 339. And in European markets, um, we have more of the same. The DAX down 24, FTSE down 24, and the CAC 40 down 14. So we're red in Europe. Red in Asia, red in the U.S., red in gold, 
oil. <laughs> That's our one green spot today. So all the bulls are in oil. Uh, they've pushed it up a whopping 30 cents against an overpowering downtrend. Well, we looked at that on a daily chart yesterday to see if it's possible that that thing could be getting ready to make a turn. Do I uh, this was on the S&P. Here, let's clear this for a second. Let's just take a peek. So anyway, happy Tuesday. If nobody's wished you a happy Tuesday yet, allow me to be the very first. Hope it's been a good day for you, wherever you are. If you're returning, welcome back. If you're here for the first time, a very special welcome to you. Okay. Now... This is the sell-off since May of this year, but we know that's not the sell-off, right? The sell-off uh, went back to, what was it, June of last year? Let's go at GCL real quick. All right, we, we got this mess because of, I don't talk about it, these continuation charts. Uh, where I wanted to get back to, I just wanted to get back to um, July of 2015. I think that's where this whole problem started, or 14, I mean. All right, let me try it without the at. Let's just go GCL. And yeah, it's not going to do it, though. Yeah, yeah, it almost does, kind of. If I bet it, well, that, that contract's not available anymore. What if? What if I took a walk on the wild side and went weekly? Would that help matters any? I doubt it. it does get me back to uh, June of 2014, pretty clearly, where we had our high, June 27th, it looks like, no, July 4th, which was a market holiday here. Had a high of 96.32, and then that led to the tumble through the end of the year, the leg and a retrace, and then this little double bottom. And what looked like the beginning, possibly, of an up move, and now over the last, well, we're in August at this point. But real quick, if I throw this on here. Now this shapes up a little differently than our daily chart did. I've shown you the daily chart quite a few times, which takes us back into this time period. But we get a bearish cross, and if I open it up, you can see it. Now this is a weekly chart, not the daily chart that I have shown you many, many times. Bearish cross, price pulls away, price pulls back, but I don't think we actually get a physical touch. On the daily, we do. On the weekly, we don't. The swing high of this candle was 89.64, and yeah, so we were off, we're, we're probably within a dollar of pulling back on the weekly chart. But this was right here, you know, what set this thing in motion from a weekly perspective was September. We got a much earlier signal on the daily chart. We got it, uh, our data just won't pull back that far at this point because we're already into the September contract this year. And my continuation charts just messed up. Uh, so in September of last year, we got the bearish cross that led to this 
leg and a retrace leg and then we got this pullback here right we got a bullish cross but price never pulled away during that bullish cross there's one two three four weeks it never pulled away and then we get the bearish cross in July of this year and it takes us down to where we are now okay if I were to very quickly if we go to Michael do that and do that I think you'll see a little more clearly I mean now again this is from a weekly perspective this candle here opened and closed in the same week but that was your entry and there was no sign to get out until we closed back above the red CFMA1 in January of this year um, getting long here uh, would have stopped you out because you were so far above and that's one of the things you need to take into consideration when you're going to look at that first candle opening above or below the CFMA1 what sort of distance is involved what does an average leg look like it's hard to know what an average leg looks like in crude oil after this incredible sell-off but in fact we have a leg and a retrace a leg and once we took out these lows at 49.74 now here we sit all the way down uh, low today 41.43 but we're actually up 30 cents on the day or we were when I started all this all right back over to the ES we've gone basically mm, nowhere this is where we were last Monday last Monday's radio trade was right about here I took all that stuff off the chart yesterday and so now we are Tuesday sitting in just about the same spot not that there hasn't been movement and volatility there has there's been some very good trading our uh, radio trade uh, radio show trade from yesterday uh, it took it a little while but it finally did the deal uh, consider being long above 2095 and it actually went from 2095 all the way up to a swing high at 2103 75 so that was an eight-point move okay and then we just kind of been consolidating here in this area above last week's weekly trading zone at 91.92 I'm going to pass the screens off to Michael at this point for a recap of everything that happened today in our live trading room uh, as soon as he finishes, I will be back for our good word for the day. We'll take a look at the concierge trade alerts from last night. David will be with us at the top of the hour from Page Trader for his forecast from the edge. And then um, my Tuesday co-host, Jonathan, is he's got something that's happening this morning to do with his other business. He's going to have his laptop and his headset with him he hopes to be able to join us at the appointed time and so we look forward to that that will be from 1 30 until 2 30 p.m. Eastern and then on Friday this is a big one you guys ready for this I finally got confirmation yesterday I didn't want to pre leak it and disappoint you and etc but you know that I've been working on a new Friday co-host Okay, and I said this is kind of a big deal, and uh, <laughs> I know you'll be surprised, but the one, the only, the Mr. Mark Douglas, the Mr. Mark Douglas of Trading in the Zone will be, as of this Friday, my new co-host, and he'll be with us every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern to answer your questions, whatever they might be. So those of you whose trading has been literally turned around by the book, the greatest trading book ever written, Trading in the Zone, if 
You want to be here, have your questions ready. Now, Mark is completing his third book, and he says this will be his final book. And I said, why is it going to be your final book? And he said, well, because when I'm done, there won't be any more questions. Ooh, ooh. Now, when he and I had lunch two years ago, I didn't realize it had been so long. He had told me when we had lunch, he says, look, let me get the book finished. And then I'll be able to focus and I'll do radio shows with you. I said, all right, that's great. And so I knew I had left him alone for a while, but it wasn't until I pulled up uh, the last text message with him to get his phone number that I realized it had been two years. And so I called him. <laughs> he says, you know, that's kind of funny. Just a couple days ago, I was looking for your phone number. I said, oh, you were going to call. You're finished with the book. He said, no. <laughs> I still got about three pages to go. And I said, oh, well, how long is that going to take? He says, I don't know. So anyway, his third and final book is in the works, and it's oh so close uh, to being published, but not yet. But he wants to spend some time with his people, the people like you who have taken his work, like myself who have taken his work, and put it to work. I mean, when I read the book, and I've told you this time and again, it really did change trading for me. And... I haven't looked back since. The ability to think in probabilities has superseded just about everything. Uh, I learned an awful lot from Mike Reed. In the early days, I took that and I coupled it with what I learned from Mark Douglas, and I put the two together. I've learned a lot from uh, Mike, my partner here at CFRN. I've learned some things from David. I, I try to learn wherever I go. Every day, I try to learn something. Uh, a day that we don't learn anything is a, maybe a day that could have been put to better use. So let's all try to learn something. And everybody, be here on Friday. Comb your hair, brush your teeth, and bring your very best questions. You've read the book. Now, there may be parts of the book that you've... Now, he had two books, uh, The Disciplined Trader. But the one that really struck me was Trading in the Zone. So... Reread that book this week or re-listen to your audio book. And if there are any points in there that have hung you up or that you would like to ask the author what he really meant or what he was really trying to share and say, uh, this is going to be your opportunity. To my knowledge, he has not in the past done a regularly scheduled radio program. So we're very excited. And uh, I told him I wanted this to be a a good time for him, a fun time, something that he would look forward to and enjoy. So I certainly want us to all do our very best to uh, help him have some fun. He's been working very, very hard on this book, and that's what he needs right now in his life. He needs to have some fun, and he needs to know that there's a group of people out there who really do appreciate his work. So, Michael, with that said, it's uh, that's a tough act to follow, brother, but if you would kindly uh, do a recap... <laughs> It is a tough uh, act to follow. The live trading room today, uh, that's pretty awesome, too. I'll just give it what I got. There you go. And that's it. Just tell the truth. Tell the truth. All right. I'm going to hit oh. mute. Okay, I'm going to hit record. Get my questions out. Uh, can you get a copy of my template? Yes, you can. All right. Hit record. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is Tuesday, the 18th day of August 2015. Let's see. Um, first, if you have not taken a free trial with us, just go to CFRN.net and in the right hand side where it says register for a free trial, put in your name, put in your email, click on register for a free trial. When you do that, you'll be sent a confirmation link. You must click the confirmation link. Okay. If you don't click the confirmation link, you're not going to get a free trial. All right. You must click the confirmation link. Um, all right. That is that. Now, our live trading room results. Um, the YouTube stream isn't up, Michael Martin says. Um, our live trading room results. If I click here and then click here, hey, you made it smaller. 
then you will go right to our spreadsheet. All right, now this spreadsheet goes back to January 2nd of 2013. Um, today in the live trading room, we made nine ticks profit in the Russell, five ticks profit in crude, and two ticks profit in the Euro. Today it took us 32 minutes and five trades to get to our goal for the day. And we were at $100 a contract when we got there. We took a total of 14 trades today. All right, so in the 12 days of August so far, we're up $2,245 per contract gross. It's $187 a day. Um, if you apply any dollar commission to every trade we've taken, you'd be up $885. If you applied a $5 commission to every trade we've taken, you'd be up $1,395. All right. So over the 152 days we've traded so far this year, we're up $36,780 per contract. That is one contract, two hours per day. All right. That averages out to $241 a day gross. Okay. $241 per day gross. Now. Let's go take a look at those trades. All right. Um, on the ES, I don't recall even looking at the ES this morning, and I don't think I did. I did not identify a single trade here on the ES today. Doesn't look like. Um, so that was it. It was back and forth between zones. That was the problem with the ES. Okay. Back and forth between weekly trading zones. Um, on the gold, what did we do on gold today? On gold today, we had a few trades in there. Um, we ended break even on the day on gold. All right. Um, our first trade on gold was right here. We were uh, break even on the first one. And the second trade was right in here. We had eight ticks profit on that one. Had a break even there. I mean, had, we missed that one. Sorry, we had uh, eight ticks profit on that one. We missed that one and that one. And we got this one. Um, that was a break-even trade. We missed that one and that one. And we stopped out pretty much to the tick on this one. That put us back to break-even on gold. We were plus eight up to this point, and then we lost eight ticks on this one, putting us back to just eight. All right. Um, let's see what else we have in here. Nothing. Nothing. All right. And that... And that was it on the day on gold. We were break even on gold. On the Russell, on the Russell, we had nine ticks profit today. That's this was I was just showing, illustrating a trade setup with that one, so I can take that off. Um, on the Russell, our first trade of that wasn't our first trade of the day, was it? No, our first trade of the day was back here on the Russell. We ended up with a break even on this one. We missed this long, that long, that long. And we got a break even on this one. Um, we missed this short, and got a break even on this one. Finally, we got some traction here, and we got nine ticks profit on this one, and that was where we ended on the Russell. Right? We took one more break even trade, um, missed a short trade in here, long trade right there. Um, Yeah, I, I wouldn't have done that there because we didn't have a lower swing. Um, it got right down into the zone here and stayed there during the break. All right, so we were plus nine on the Russell, on the Russell today. And on crude oil, see all these I missed right in here, all those and that one. This is the price you pay for helping. Happy Tuesday, John. Um, on crude, our first trade right here was uh, plus two ticks. Our next trade was minus eight ticks, so we're at minus six at that point. Um, we got back to break even on this one. All right. Actually, we got seven ticks on that one. We got to plus one on that one. Um, we missed a trade here, here, there, and there. And we got four ticks profit on this, putting us at plus five on the day. All right. Missed a trade here. And what time was that? 11.22? I don't know. Looks like we missed one right there, too. All right. Changed directions, and it was a long right there during the break. And then it flattened out. So on crude, we were plus five on the day. All right. Soybeans. I was saying back here, and back here, back here, that the soybeans should get down to uh, 9.01. They got all the way down to 9.02.50. 
at first I was saying 903 and then I said 901, but it didn't get down to 901 yet. Um, we didn't have a single trade set up in the live trading room today on, on soybeans. Okay, we almost had one, but not quite. They just flattened right out. All right, on the Euro. Um, okay, in here on the Euro, we had, uh, excuse me, in here on the Euro, in here on the Euro, we had one long trade, one lonely little long trade right here. Um, we were in it for a little while, and we only got three ticks profit out of it. I was thinking it was going to get up here to the dynamic resistance, but it never made it all the way up there. Okay, it made it all the way up there. And anyway, that was where we ended the day on the arrow. All right, so let me get my spreadsheet back out here. This one. On the day, we were plus nine on the Russell, plus five on crude, plus two on the euro. It took us 32 minutes and five trades to get to our goal for the day, and we took a total of 14 trades. On the month, we are now up $2,245 a contract. That's over 12 trading days. We're averaging $187 a day. Um, our yearly total so far is $36,780 a contract. That's over 152 trading days, averaging $241 per day. Okay, now if you have not taken a free trial with us, then you simply need to go to our homepage at CFRN.net and in the right hand column where it says name, put in your name, where it says email, put in your email, click on register for a free trial. When you do that, you'll be sent to confirmation link, okay? Click on the confirmation link and you will get your free trial. All right, that's how we roll. All right, I know that was fast, but there weren't that many trades today. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Uh, I'm on, I'll send you that right away. Um, that's it, we can head back out to Phoenix if Phoenix is ready. I'm gonna stop the recording here. Since we don't have any questions and I'm on, I'm gonna send you that email that you are requesting right away. Um, Phoenix, are you out there? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah it was one thing real quick. Um, today. So, what was uh recap? The recap. Uh, today it took us 32 minutes and five trades to get to hundred dollars a contract. 32 minutes and five trades. Okay, yesterday it took two minutes in one trade. Uh, yes, I believe that is the case. Yeah, so what did you do different? I did the same exact thing over and over and over again. Nothing different. I I almost had it on my first trade of the day. I'll show you here on the Russell. Let me show you. My very first trade on the Russell... back here this one right here it it started to jump down and I got short and it went four ticks in profit so I moved my stop to break even but my entry if I remember right was at 18 and it dropped all the way down to 17 on this first move but using my, my aggressive risk management it got me out at break even so it took me a little while um, if I'd have seen this trade over here I'd have gotten some profit on that one just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. This is how we do it. So, guys, that's what you got to, you know, if you don't have a grasp on this whole thing yet, which we don't feel bad. It takes a while. Um, <laughs> but it's not, it's not switching it up every day. It's not trying out something new every day. It's not constantly being on the hunt for that new thing, that new indicator, oscillator, filter, uh, chat room guru, crystal ball, all of that stuff. You, if, if, you, if you'll break it down to the simplest common uh, denominator, let me grab these charts for me so you can take care of whatever you've got to do. Okay, 
there any unanswered questions in the chat box? Um, what price Euro trade? Okay, let me go take a look. The Euro. When I got long on the Euro, it was on the up close of this right here. It was at 1044 or 1040, 1043 or 1044, Arvin. Um, Kirby, I don't know yet. Um, why do I use risk management on different trade setups? I use the same risk management on all trade setups, Dennis. Same risk management on all trade setups. Okay. Hey, Michael, uh, thanks for the heads up there on the YouTube stream not being up. I don't have it up and running today, and, and that was for a reason. Um, the fact that, that you noticed, I appreciate that. If if you need it, if it's if it makes it better for if it's easier for you to enjoy the show that way, I can I can kick it up and running. It'll be back up tomorrow, and it'll be back up uh, every day uh, going forward. If you need it up today, I'll put it up for you. Just let me know. Um, okay, did you answer Dennis's question? I did. Okay, I answered all the questions. So Michael M, are you there? Okay. Huh. If I put the stream up now, it's gonna be well I doubt he would have popped in here just to tell me that it wasn't up. Maybe he was just why don't we just let me just turn the doggone thing on. Okay, greetings for those of you that are just now tuning in to our YouTube live broadcast. Welcome. Today is Tuesday, the 18th day of August 2015. Someone told us that we were missed on the tube, and so we turned on the tube, and now we're tubing. And all of a sudden, I got that flashing light in the right-hand corner. Is that you, Michael? No, that is not me. That is Mike Reed. Oh, Mike's in the house. Okay. Yep, he said he's right. got to 110. Okay, buddy. Well, don't worry. I'll breeze right through what I got to do, and then we'll get to you. Because I always like to talk to you. So just hang tight. Okay. All right. How do I do this in the most efficient amount of time? I got YouTube going. Okay. CT, have you set up yet somewhere to see your guest speakers and who they are each day and time on the radio? I appreciate this addition and your hard work you do for Oh. Thank you very much, Iris. Uh, you know, here's the deal. I think none of my guests want to be on camera. We have the technology in place now to do it, but I don't think I really... <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to be on radio. Um, it's another thing to have a camera at you. I've thought of putting a camera here in the studio, but putting it far enough away at an angle... You know, so that if, uh, I don't know, if I had a pimple or something, you wouldn't see it. It would just, you would court, you would see this guy at work doing radio. It wouldn't be right up in my face like they do on TV where you can, you know, count the teeth kind of thing. So, I don't know, Iris, it might come to pass someday. I, I was really into doing that. Then the more I thought about having to actually, you know, comb my own hair and put on a clean shirt every day. I mean, as long as you don't stand up, you don't have to wear pants. You can stay in your boxers or your jogging pants or whatever it is that you wear that you're comfortable around home with, your pajamas. Um, anyway, thanks for asking. John B. says, don't feel bad. I was in the Internet abyss this morning. I think it's okay now. Oh, good. Oh, you meant a schedule. I'm sorry. Okay. 
I'm thank you for prompting me I really need to get that done and I should get it done today which what it'll say is on Monday who the guest speaker is and on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday okay I, I thought you meant when we were going to do all the little talking heads across the bottom of the screen I know what you mean and yes that desperately needs to be done and it certainly needs to be done before Mark shows up on Friday so thank you for the reminder I'll get busy on that okay let's get rolling here uh, let's go to our good word for the day we've been talking about the power of vision yesterday we talked about Mother Teresa and her work in the slums of Calcutta today we're going to go in a little different direction we finished that three-part series on vision today this is a standalone take it to the Lord John 9 3 says so the power of God could be seen in him when Jesus encountered a blind man his disciples immediately began to discuss the man's condition they asked was this man's blindness the result of his own sins or the sins of his parents? Jesus answered, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Now notice four things. One, the disciples were eager to attribute the man's problem to sin. Satan will try to convince you that because of your sin, you're disqualified from God's grace well you're not for he says to Moses I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion Romans 9 15 now two when Jesus healed him the neighbors wanted to, to debate not celebrate they started asking isn't this the man who used to sit and beg some said he was and others says oh no that's not him John 9 8 through 9 number three his healing failed the religiosity test because the Pharisees says this man Jesus is not from God for he is working on the Sabbath John 9 16 well, it would be okay with me if, if I got healed on a Sunday. How about you? Number four, even the man's parents weren't free to praise God because anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. Religion, return to bondage, it kills. It's deadly. John 9.22 his own parents could not rejoice because their blind son was healed they couldn't rejoice because to say that Jesus was the Messiah would have them thrown out of church shunned as the uh, Amish do you, you don't want to be shunned it's a terrible thing all right to the neighbors he was a misfit to church leaders he was a topic of debate to his parents a social stigma so they threw him out John 9 34 end of story thank God no Jesus found him and said I have come into this world so that the blind will see John 9 35 39 so instead of rehashing your problem and listening to other people's opinions take it to the Lord in prayer how many times do we do that we sit with our problems and we sift them and we organize them and we put them in file folders and we label them and first we do it alphabetically and then maybe it'd be better if it was numerically and then oh gosh maybe I should use a different kind of filing system maybe I should put it on my computer and not on paper we stratify and 
we filter and we file and we fumble. Why not just take it to God? Or we go ask people for their opinion. Well, this is my problem. What do you think? This is my problem. Pretty soon, everybody in town knows your business. And still, you don't know the answer. Because you've asked 10 different people their opinion. They've all given you 10 different answers in some cases. And sometimes there's wisdom. I'm not saying you shouldn't seek wise counsel. Because when you start hearing that same thing again and again, you know, maybe that is God speaking to you through those men. But be careful who you go taking your business to and your problems to. Take your pro If you're going to go for counsel, take it to someone who's leading a life that you believe is one that you should aspire to because that person has aspired to live their life like Jesus. And so, again, instead of rehashing your problem, sorting it, filing it, filtering it, and listening to other people's opinions, just go to the Lord in prayer. When you share it with others, the best you'll get is sympathy. But when you share it with Jesus, you'll get a solution. A solution. Who could use a solution today? I could use a few. So that's a good word for the day. All right, let's go to the chart. It hasn't moved much. To give you a radio trade right now would be, um, gosh, we, we've got 90, yeah, I mean, we're sitting right on top of a, and I, um, <laughs> if we were to run back up, look, this candle here, it actually went from 2100 to 2093 in an hour. That's, well, that's pretty good. 2091. All right, here's what we'll do. Consider being short below 2090 if. As we all know, that means if. Gosh, this dyslexia thing, I'm telling you, it came with age. I was not like this in my younger days. Consider being short below 2090 if the opportunity presents. Okay, now we'll look for a two-point move on that, and if we get that, that's fine, two points. If it drops all the way down to 2085, well, you know, hey, things happen. All right, let's go look at bonds real quick as we head off to talk to Mike Reed here in just a minute. Okay, bonds did us nice. Uh, we had an alert last night that said, and I shall read it to you verbatim, on the bonds, consider being long above 158.30, short below 158.16. We always have a bias and opinion if we're going lower or higher, you can't be a trader or an analyst and not have an opinion. The thing is, I could be wrong. And so, I give you and anyway, the I was trying to read John's comment there. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Anyway, let's just do it. Consider being long above 158.30. All right, 158.30 took us up to 159.10. Now, how do we figure this? Think for a moment. How many ticks are there? There's 32 ticks to a point. So from 158.30 to 32, that's two, right? And so if the swing high is 159.10, then the answer becomes 12 ticks, right? tick rally. How many ticks do we need to be done for the day in bonds? Four. Okay, pays 3125 per tick. 3125. Now this short below 158.16. 
The first move took us down to 158.12. That's four ticks. Okay. This entire move took us down to 157.26. Now, if it went all the way to 156.16, another 10 ticks, that would be, now think about it like this, 156.16 to 157.16, that would be one point or 32 ticks, right? Except the swing low is 157.26. 26. So that's not 32 ticks, but 22 ticks. Hmm. A little math lesson there today. I'm telling you, I wrestled with that 32 ticks to a point thing for a while. I finally got a, I finally got a handle on that. Uh, the other one, though, the 10-year the notes, I never, for some reason, that's why I don't show them. I just, I could never get it in my head calculating that properly, and Bert wouldn't teach me, so. He said he would, but anyway. So on bonds, we had a 12-tick rally, 22-tick drop. Crude oil, long above 42.45, we got up to 42.43. So that's 18 ticks, okay? 18. Now, would I expect you to get them all? No. However, if you're trading it, what I would expect is that you get stopped out with at least your daily goal of 10 ticks. It takes 10 ticks to be done for the day in crude. Swing low here. First we drop from 60 to 48. That's 12. That's a 12 tick drop, okay? That's enough to be done for the day right there in that hourly candle. That's a 12 tick drop. You need 10 ticks. The swing low was 43, and so 60 minus 43 would be 17. That makes sense. Yeah. So we had a 17 tick drop in total. Okay. Again, do you get all 17? Probably not. I mean, it came back to test right here and then dropped again. So if you were alert and awake and trading at this time of night, then you caught this or you caught this, okay? Okay, today so far we don't have a trigger in the S&P. In the S&P, the alert was to be long above 2105 or short below 2090. Neither one has happened yet. Very sideways in the S&P. So this thing is coiling as they call it, tightening up, and it's getting ready to cut loose and do something. On soybeans, the alert to be short below 922 came to pass. Um, I'm sorry, well, it was long above 922, which didn't come to pass, short below 910 did. And in the first drop here, we get down to a low of 908. So that gives us our two pennies for the day. If you're trading soybeans, looking for the $100 per contract per day as part of the 2420 blueprint, that's all you need is those two pennies right there. We do know that important prices in important areas are almost always tested. So it comes back and does two pennies again, and then it comes back and does much more than two pennies. Well, on the second go around, it did mm, almost three cents. It did two and three quarter cents. And then on the third move down, it actually dropped all the way to 902, uh, which was 902.50, which was seven and a half cents. But if you were just trading in this hour here, it dropped to 904 and a quarter. And so that would be five and three quarter cents, but you only need two cents to be done for the day, all right? So, so far, every market, with the exception of the ES, has provided us with the opportunity to be done for the day. The Dow still has not triggered, neither long nor short, so we wait. The day's not over quite yet. Gold, okay, I haven't marked that one yet. Let me do it real quick. 2200 20 was when the alert went out last night. No, 22, because they went out at... 
10, 12, yeah, 22, 22, 22, 22. 22, okay. And the alert said to be long above 1120, which, hmm, got ticked into that one. Uh, a couple ticks on each one of those. And so this one actually went four ticks. Maybe you got to stop to break even. Depends on if you're trading just the break, if you're using the indicators or a combination. That looks like a stop out to me. Now the other side, that's a different story. On the short side for gold, to be short below 11.14, okay, right here, we put in a swing low down at 11.08.50. So we'll call it 11.09. So that's five points. Alert. 11.14. Okay. Okay. So here, this up here, I'm just going to call that a stop out. We'll leave it go at that. And here we drop to 850. So we'll bump that to 9 because you're going to get stopped out with less than the full amount as it pulls back on you. Okay, so even if you got out with uh, 1109, that would be a $5 drop, which would be $500 per contract, okay? That's what that move right there was worth, $500 per contract. So if you get stopped out for a little bit up here, you can pick up 500 per contract. That's not too bad. The Euro, the Euro, boy, we were doing just well with the Euro there for a while, and then it got a little bit perplexing, and so we're letting it sort itself out, but we continue to put out the alert every night Last night's alert on the euro said 111.05 on the upside, which did not happen. But we did trigger on the short side 111.07D, which is going to be pretty easy to figure right there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we drop down to 55. So that's 15 ticks right here. In this first hourly move, we get a swing low of 1055. That's 15 ticks. How many do we need? Eight. Eight ticks is all you need. At 1250 per tick, you're done for the day. Price then comes back to test the important price, important area, as it does, you know, frequently, like almost always. And we get a swing low on this hour of 10.30, so that's a 40 tick drop times 12.50 per tick. And so far, it's put in a swing low on the day all the way down at 21. Okay, so that's a uh, 41 tick drop. I think I did the math right. And then the last one, and then we'll head out and talk to Mike, is the Russell. And... 2,200 hours is right here. Yeah. Okay. And on the Russell, consider being short below 1221. 1221. Did I get that right? Nope. 1221. Yeah, there we go. Okay, alert 1221. Let's write this down so I don't forget tomorrow. 1221. Okay. All right, so from 1221, we put in a swing low down at, looks like 121390. So call that 1214. And so that would be a seven point drop. And the Russell pays $100 per point. So that's a $700 move. That's the potential. Are you going to take 700 out of it? Probably not. You know, on one of these pullbacks along the way, you're going to get stopped down. Maybe you just get your, you know, what you need for the day. Like right here, 
Well, the first hour on the trigger here, it goes down to 12, 19, 20. Okay, you only need one point. That's it. One point gives you your 100 for the day. And, it's, and we're still dropping. Okay, so I better take that 7 off. And we'll come back and revisit that later and see what the final low on the day is going to be. So the Russell was good and the Euro was good and gold was good and the bonds were good and the Dow hasn't triggered. Soybeans were good. The ES hasn't triggered. Crude was good and all is good. So now it's time to go talk to our good friend, Mike Reed at TradeStalker.com. Mike, how are you? Hello, Dwayne. I'm good. How are you? Good, man. Nice to hear your voice. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, I did. Um, let me see what I did. Whatever I did, it was a good weekend. <laughs> um, I relaxed pretty much, I guess. I'm just breaking down here on the ES, but we come on air. Um, you might get your radio trade here after all. Um, it looks like it's starting to work its way down, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, these are last week's zones. What do you got up in this area? Anything? Up above or down below here? Either way. Down below? Yeah. Oh, above I had um, at 21.02, um, which, man, I wanted to see that. wanted to see that. They just missed it yesterday and have put on partial position and put options and put on some more this morning. But anyways, I was looking for a decent sized pullback and the number on the downside is your actually your trigger is in my next uh, next support. So if they take out the uh, 90 area, like you said, then they, you know, they could go another Four, four or five points, roughly. Yeah, I I, I see it going down to if it takes out 90, then I think we very well might see 85. Yeah. Um. We were very stretched coming into the day, and we're looking for. Well, geez, I had a bias when you <laughs> indicators gave me a bias that said I should be careful on the long side and looking at the short side so um, odds favored this so this is what finally getting this break here um, not sure what else we got else going on here I don't think um, there's any new oh tomorrow we get a, um, something on the Fed I'm not sure what that will yeah tomorrow is the Fed minutes uh, meeting okay. Or the are the are the minutes of the Fed meeting. Okay. Now uh, I don't know if you were tuned in yesterday, but I talked to Garrett about bringing Peter Eli Eliads. Is that Elides? Elides. I gotta I gotta write it down somehow that I phonetically remember how to spell that. E. Yeah. Eliades. Eliades. Eli. Uh. Ds. Eliades. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Anyway, uh, Garrett said, yeah, that he would invite him to come on. So I don't know if it's going to be today. I mean, not today, but if it's going to be next Monday or if we're going to do a special day for that and do a perhaps a standalone podcast. Okay. Did you ask right. if you could be in on that conversation? Um, yeah, we, last time we spoke. I yeah, I, th that I thought that's what you said. So, okay, I will um, – I'll let, let me. I'm gonna. I'm supposed to call Garrett today. He sent me an email last night, so I'll call him and find out what time is going to work for those guys, and then I'll get a hold of you and let you know, because I would love to have you in on the conversation. And Burrell has said that he would very much like to be in on the uh, roundtable discussion as well. So it might suit us better to have this as a standalone podcast. We'll record live to tape as we always do, and. Um, We'll broadcast it, of course, for the radio audience, and um, that might work well. Might work better for you too, because you've got your room and everything to focus on in the daytime. But let me see. It's really since everybody wants to talk to Peter, it's going to really depend upon his schedule and what time he's able to make available. Now, right. Garrett said in his email that he's got a couple of good shows lined up, so I'm thinking he's got a couple of other folks uh, that he and Peter work with that he's 
uh, considering inviting onto the show, mm-hmm. onto his Monday portion. So we'll look forward to that. Speaking of, it is David's time to come on, so let me just uh, bring him in real quick here. And don't go away. Stay put. We'll be right back. You're listening to CFRN, a community of believers who trade for a living. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and how we do it, call toll-free 1-866-928-3310. And we'll send you out a no-obligation information kit absolutely free. 866 928 good morning Dwayne hey David good morning welcome to the show Thank you very much, and good morning, Mike Reed. How are you doing? Hello, David. I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Good. Good. Thank you very much. Good to hear from you. Nice to hear from you, Mike. Um, so what, Walmart. I don't have much time. <clears throat> no, that's, go ahead. Go ahead and talk oh. to David for a minute. What okay. What did you say, Mike? I said, how are things in your world? Um, hot, because it's so oh, hot here in Las Vegas. Hot. Yeah. My world is hot. That's what I tell people when I meet them. I don't know how you can handle that stuff. I just well, it's I know it's that old saying, it's a dry heat, but it has not been. It there's been a few really hot days, and it is some of them are miserably hot. But the summer overall has not been terrible. It's been a relatively minor sum or mild summer, and it has also been a, a very mild winter that we had. Mm-hmm. So I'm very happy to say that we, uh, you know. We haven't. It hasn't been that difficult. What would um, sunny and 80 degrees feel like? To feel like today? it would feel very, very wonderful. I would be. I would get up from my desk and be jumping around outside. Okay. And people would say, "Who, who is this that's jumping up and down here? This is a business environment." And I would say, "It's me, Dave yeah. Williams." No. Um, I just would love that weather. Yeah. Well, could you handle? Could you handle three months with the temperature at yes. 40, or, 40 or below? Uh, no. I, well, yeah, I could probably handle that. I don't know how much below 40, but I probably could. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're not in a tundra. We're not in <laughs> except for a few, a few occasions lately, but, yeah, normally it's not too bad. Oh, that's good. Well, no, I, I know you guys have wonderful weather out there. I don't know what your humidity and all that is, but... You know, oh, it's, it, <laughs> it's funny, as you get older, I mean, not that everybody feels this way, but I think weather becomes more important because, you know, you're trying to get every day of your life to be as as happy as you can and you want to be not so miserable. I enjoy cool weather. Also, I don't have a problem with cool or even cold. Uh, some people do, but generally women don't like the cold and men seem to be okay with it. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know where to speak off to, David. I have to. Um, I have about five minutes at the most. So okay. Well, why don't you so. update us on what's happening with you, Mike? Um, with me. Yeah. Um, boy, I guess I'm boring. There's not a whole lot going on. Finally, my oh. parents are in a in a decent place. Uh, um, adult living. Uh, I mean, assisted living. So they got. They're back in decent health, not good health. Good. But, you know, that helps pretty, to be in those assisted livings. If you can oh, yeah. pull that off, um, it's yeah. so much better than any other way to do it. I, I think people will uh, find that out for themselves. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think it's helping them out because, um, boy, they were both in very bad shape. But um, oh. this seems to be out of the hospital and rehab kind of dealing to a uh, an apartment. It's not home, you know, and mm-hmm. I know they miss home, but it's better than um, the other place. <laughs> so at least mm-hmm. they have their own, own place to be in, their own, their own little apartment. Like and yes. whatever medications they need, they give them to them there. You know, all right. of that stuff is fantastic, and it makes you know that they're being better taken care of and all right. that. 
Right. And they eat well, eat well, and um, they get the help they need and the care they need. So, yeah, yeah. it's all good. That um, is a good. Oh, that's good. I'm glad for you, uh, Mike. Yeah. yeah, makes it easier. So. Um, yeah. That's thankful for that. Well, good. Uh, it'll it'll work out much better. Yeah. So, Michael, beyond today, are you looking for lower prices in the S&P? Mm, I think tomorrow will be. Today, I really thought we'd have a. Um, we're not over yet. Not over yet, but I thought we'd have a bigger, a decent, sort of decent size pullback. But um, I'll have to take out the 90 area for that to happen. That's basically what. Uh, into tomorrow, I think, is what's going to be important. It goes the, the Fed thing. If we sell off in tomorrow, maybe we could get another rally. But um, I, I still think 2102, 2103 has to be taken out for, uh, you know, we've been in this big range since um, I was looking at it. We started trading in these areas at the, very, at the second week of February in this levels on the S&P cash index um, in this range and it's it's, a, it's less than just under 100 points and we've been back and forth and back and forth and if we don't get above 2103 we're just going back to the top of the range and then coming back down again that's kind of the way I see it right now so or they may have missed it and put in the high yesterday, so or this morning. So yeah, Dwayne, I think we do have we do have lower prices then. Okay. Probably get to tomorrow. All right, my friend. Well, listen, take care. I know you got to run. Okay. Thank you, Dwayne. And, I'll uh, keep you. Um... Okay. Go ahead. Oh, just say, David. Yeah, nice nice checking with you. Mike. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. You too. Take care. All right, Mike, and I'll give you a, I'll give you a heads up on that uh, interview with Peter, so that you can figure out how you can work that into your schedule. Okay. Okay, great. Thank All you, right. Mike. Okay. Have a good day, guys. You too. See Bye. you later. Yeah, Peter Alides, uh I used to. Uh, I think he had a again a back in the '90s a one nine hundred number that I used to call, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and. Uh, I'm positive, some kind of service that mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. going to uh, many, many, many years ago. And uh, I think it would be nice for these people, and I think it is nice for these people to know that they had whatever impact they had on people, um, in their whether it's directly in their trading or just in their enthusiasm for the markets and so on. He's been around for a long time, very much like a teacher, you know, who maybe taught in high school or a university and their student comes back or a student comes back you know yeah. 10 years 15 years 20 years later to say I just wanted to tell you that you know certain things that you said or did had an impact and so on you know what a nice thing so uh, so you know that's nice that's very nice because these guys are getting up in years I think now uh, yeah and I don't know how recent these pictures are I'm going to assume that was maybe that sort of has a 60s kind of a look to it. I don't know. And this is probably closer to today. I don't know. Maybe he's got a current picture on his uh, website. Stock market cycles. About Peter. A Let's very, see. Very big Here we go. Cycle. Got yeah, it. this is this is this is probably pretty close. I will. I'm. I don't know, but uh, cause I've never seen the guy before. Uh, let's see, he went to Harvard, Boston Law School. He's got three children. Way too much to read here, but you guys can go read it and uh, get ready for the interview. Uh, Peter Eliades. And so what was it that you got from him, David? What did you, uh, when you would call in this number and, and look at uh, this information? Just, I think I got the impression, uh, well, I got impressions from him, I think. Uh, he was, he's a long-term, at least back then, it was long-term cycles. You know, maybe not as long-term as your other guest who talks about the, the really big long wave. Uh-huh, you know, right. Uh, 
but you know, I I've, I remember him talking about thousands of hours of, you know, cycle. Like like this cycle is you know, one one thousand three hundred and fifty six hours, or something like that, or that something was expected to happen, you know, at that point in time. And I just remember thinking, wow, you know, that's that's a really lot of hours to think that something is tracking all of that and that something's going and that I think that was part of for me the beginning of understanding uh, you know to whatever degree so understanding cycles to some some degree um, everyone understands cycles in the sense of like the Sun rising and the Sun setting and you know the seasons those are cycles that we all see but when it comes to the stock market it seems like well, what what cycle? Where where am I looking for? Where does it start? Where does it sure. end? Yeah. And all that. And so when you're starting in the markets, that's probably a a question you know that's on your mind is like what what the heck are you talking about with cycles? And I you know I had no background in uh, the the this whole the conceptual side of cycles and the conceptual side of how they might apply to various things like the market. So I can't say that. Um, so now, so you would call the number, and yeah. he would. It would. The voice would say. The recording would say, uh, "Something's going to happen on a certain well, no, day or time." No, you would say, "This is Peter Elides. You know, uh, we've got a such and such cycle that's going to come in on this date and this whatever." Uh, okay. You know, he did other cycle work as well, but I remember for some reason I remember being impressed with the idea that he was tracking something that went for thousands of hours mm -hmm. you know that that he had broken it down to that level that had not been something it just seemed it just seemed to him that that left some impression on it me. seems well most cycle stuff I've I've seen and and I don't it's not I don't it's not something I follow closely or if, if at all I suppose uh, but you what I have read generally was talked about in days or months okay. or years. Now you mentioning that it, he spoke in hours. I think that's the first time that I've that I've heard it broken down into hours that way. Yeah. So. Well, and this was back in the 90s. That seemed it seemed advanced for sure. the time, you know, well, it, and so yeah. on. I mean, so, uh, it was a could, lot so of, could you take what he said? I mean, was there an actionable? Did did he end with an actionable comment? Mm, buy this or be hard long for, No, no, or, I don't think he was saying buy something. I think he was, and he'll have to clarify because this was this is 20 years ago. You know, mm -hmm. for me, I mean, it, it was probably in 1995 or 1994, something like that. But uh, I think, or even earlier, I think my phone period was probably more closer to the first three years that I was involved involved in the markets, which was starting in May of 1990. So you know the first three years probably 93 ish so is you know this is you know this is 23 years ago mm -hmm. um, my memory though is that um, he was more likely saying things like you know watch for maybe a turn or watch for something like that it, I don't think he was giving out he wasn't really an advisory saying buy here and sell here as much as he was uh, a cycles person and the market is filled with so many different things going on that it's um, you know you could sit down and come up with almost any kind of this is not to discount anyone's work certainly um, but I'm saying you could really look at the markets and sit down and come up with almost any kind of way to look at the market whether it's planetary or you know ocean based you know with tidal waves uh, currents uh, electromagnetism and you would find something in the market that would appear to correlate to your chosen thing. You know the uh, the you know the harvesting of walnut trees in South Africa. You know always puts a bottom in you know in the market. You you could find that. That's the thing. The market has so much going on that you literally can find really whatever you're looking for. You can kind of find whatever you're looking for in the market. It's almost a peculiar thing to say, but. Um, and because I, I say that because I myself, you know, looked at many many kinds of cycle work uh, that others had done because I don't know anything about cycles at that point, and I looked at every kind of way of thinking about cycles, and you know, at some point, you uh, you understand what they mean by what they say and so on, 
Um, my current so, work isn't really related to cycles per se, but I think that others that are you know, looking into the markets and studying, I think one of the things I would tell somebody, um, like as an example, my daughter recently, and I think it's partly because she doesn't like her current job, she has started recently to say, Dad, I want to come to your office and I want to you know, learn what you do and how you do it. And you know, she's she's completely green. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, she has no, absolutely no knowledge. It would, you know, she needs to get up to a, a very, a certain level before you can even address what, you know, she has to understand what the market is, how it works, what a price bar is. I mean, just, and, and the whole concept of how all of this means something and all that. Um, but I think for people uh, like my daughter or anyone else that's in the markets, the market has enough going on in it that, and this is a problem, that you could find whatever you're looking for <laughs> in the market. You know what I'm saying? Because there's so many things happening. You could say, well, you know, every time a tree falls, you know, in the forest, it seems like the market makes a, a blip up or a blip down, and you could find that in the market. Um, what is difficult is to find something that is persistently a truth about the market, and that's why I always, for me, I started resorting to um, principles more than I was resorting to looking for a cause to, you know, this thing happens and then the market does this, or the Super Bowl gets won by such and such a team, and instead of looking that way, I went, uh, I thought, you know, that's really hard, I can find anything that I want in this market, and I went towards the idea of principles that if I could find something that was true about the nature, is it does the market have a nature? You know, that would be the first question. And if it does have a nature, then there's some principle that would apply to that nature. And that's ultimately, many, many years later, you know, back starting in around 1998 was when I first sort of realized that I could find anything I wanted in the market. I could connect it to anything and find to appear to work, and then I could spend the rest of my life searching that out. And I had been doing that. I, I, I had found a number of things that I connected to the market, and one of them, of course, was planetary stuff, and one of them was weird, unconnected things that seemed like they were connected. So I ultimately, in 1998, that's when I had my first insight into maybe the, the problem isn't what to connect the market up to, like every time this happens, the market does this, which is what a lot of people um, are doing, and I, they probably have found some interesting things. I did. I found some interesting things that way, but nothing that was persistent throughout the market. And so uh, I went in the direction of principles, and I tried to discover if the market had a nature, because I knew if it had a nature, you know what I mean by that, like a human being has a nature, a person has a nature, a sweet nature, a mean nature, whatever. If the market actually had a nature, then I could say that there was principles that it would operate under. So I went in that direction, and <clears throat> you know, that's I would suggest that others. It may not be for everybody, but I would suggest for others that they take a look at it that way. And I have to say that I, I can say that my stepfather Jerome Richfield, uh, who dealt in the world of philosophy and principles, was probably a part. My, my upbringing was around a man who always was throwing principles at you. You know, um, the way that he addressed everything seemed like he, you know, he was a very, if you, if you met him and knew him for a while, you'd say, well, he was a very principled man because that's what was a thing with him. And so that finally sort of appeared in my life in the trading world with principles. So um, that's how I kind of think of the market. Um, and that has led, by thinking of the market in terms of principles, it took me away from trying to connect the market to a thing that whenever this thing happens, this always happens, you know, that kind of thing. And that's why I've said on your program many times that I'm not looking for the market, you know, regular technical work is looking for the market to repeat a certain thing every time. Like, you know, the stochastic gets under 20, mm -hmm. and then you look for a bounce, and there's nothing right. wrong with that. That that will occasionally happen, and it can it could probably it can probably result in a decent trading system if you work uh, at that. But I got away from that and um, found that, and this is why I've said it many times on your program that I'm actually looking for something different 
to happen this time. That's it's the exact opposite. I'm not looking for the same thing to happen. I'm trying to figure out how it's going to do it differently this time than last time. And that's one of the major differences, I think, between, I um, mean, if I really put a broad overview, the major difference between uh, what we do at PageTrader and ordinary technical work of any kind when it comes to the market is that if you look at technical analysis, it's one of the key things about it is that it's always looking for the same thing to happen this time just like it did last time. So when this certain thing happens, this this cause happens, it makes the market do this thing every time. And our work is that flipped over on its head. Our work <laughs> is saying when this thing happens, it's going to happen differently this time. And through a principle, we're going to figure out, or through a couple of principles, we're going to figure out how it's going to be different this time than it was last time. And that has been good for me. That has worked for me. So I would just suggest for people who are thinking about markets and you know, want to trade them, on the philosophical side, there's more than one way to do, uh, to think about technical analysis because virtually every book, virtually every method is trying to say when this happens, the same thing is going to happen in the market. And so just remember, that isn't the only way to think about the market. There's other ways to think about the market. And you do have to be a um, you have to experiment with ideas and think outside of whatever box you're in. And if you'll do that, you, you'll find some ideas that are very interesting and that may come to use uh, for you from time to time. They don't have to be in the market. Listen, if we come up with a trade today, the idea that made that trade possible may not reoccur in the market tomorrow or the next day or the next day. It may take some time before that particular principle gets put into play. So, um, you know, that's that's how our stuff is, I think, different, is we're not looking for the same thing to happen. And I think later, at some point, um, people will learn more about that idea and they'll recognize that there is real value in not merely the most obvious thing would be to say, when this happens, I always look for this to happen. When this happens, I always look for this to happen. That is really painfully, almost um, obnoxiously uh, obvious, and the market is a little slicker than that. You know, um, it isn't the same every time. It's different every time, and if you can learn to deal with the differences, you will have a better uh, trade, I think. So, you know, there you are. If you said, if somebody came to me and said, "Look, at when the market gets really oversold." You know, and even though I won't go into that discussion, we've talked about it before, but let's just use the phrase. The market gets really oversold. They're looking to buy the market because it's going to go up. And so he could say, if I'm looking for oversold, shouldn't I be looking for the same thing, which is for the market to go up? And I would have to answer yes within the context of that question. I would have to say, if oversold is your thing, and the market's going down, yeah, you would be looking for the market to do the same thing, which is for it to go up. So those same things things are in there, in, in the market. But there's much, much better ways to view the market than simply looking for the same thing to happen. But uh, going back to Peter, just, just briefly, I just want to say this. Um, he is a part of a number of people that I would like to publicly give credit to in terms of being a part of my, uh, you know, starting in the markets. He was around. He was somebody that for a short period of time I would call his number, and only a short period because I just didn't really get a lot of what he was doing at the time with cycles and all that stuff. But I remember distinctly listening to recordings of him talking. He and um, – I can't think of so many of these people's names today, but there was another, Jerry Favors was another one who uh, was around and was a very entertaining market personality talking. He, he used other people's methodology but had his own spin on them. The, you know, he would use Elliott and all these other methods, and, and he was kind of giving out uh, advisory. And uh, there's a few, there's several others that were out there. Victor Sporandio, uh, he used to have a hotline. I called his hotline back in the early 90s. Oh, the guy we talked about yesterday, yes. Trader Vic. Yeah, Trader Vic. Mm -hmm. Trader Vic. And um, give credit to him. Um, all these people have been, were a part of the whole, you know, upbringing and stuff. And many of them were, I think, for their time, many of them were actually kind of ahead of the curve 
you know, for I mean, nowadays a lot of stuff is caught up, and uh, but for their for their peak in their day, several of these people were doing some pretty neat stuff uh, back then. So, you know, I can look back now and say, yeah, that was you know, there was some pretty interesting stuff they were doing for back in 1993. And, uh, and this was before the internet. How did you even know they were doing this, or how how did you know their services were available? Yeah, their services were all advertised in magazines, and uh, that's where I got their phone numbers, and that's where you would see their ads. Okay. So you'd be calling out of magazines. In fact, um, it was only shortly after I started in May of 1990. I mean, in May of 1990, you could already get a thing, uh, you know, a platform set up in your house with a tube monitor and, uh, you know, this big box that would hook up to the satellite. They didn't have the internet, so they were doing it by satellite. Mm -hmm. That's how CQG was doing it. Um, and then finally, at some point in, in maybe the mid-90s or something, CQGs went to CQGs for, CQG for Windows, and, and then when the internet came out, that just opened the door for everybody to have access to this, uh, right. to data and so on. So, so these these magazines were they trading magazines or popular science or uh, no no they were trading magazines there was a whole bunch of them out there um, one of our one of my great friends Joel Levine who uh, just texted me here I just want to make a comment that uh, Joel's a little bit older than I am but I'm not going to give his age away but he <laughs> was listening to Peter Alides just so you understand how long this guy's been around in 1977 wow yeah so Peter Alides has been around for a long time has uh, made his mark in the world of whatever his world is, whether it's cycles or whatever. He's been around for an awfully long time. It's the year 2015, and 1977 is 38 years ago. So he, he's, been on the, he's been on the burner for quite some time. Uh, Larry Williams has been around uh, for, a very, for a similar amount of time. Um, some of these other big names that uh, have been around I, I've not met most of these people, but uh, you know, through magazines, I guess stocks and commodities, and some of these other trading magazines, they would have all these ads in there, and you would call the 900 number, and you would listen to somebody say, "This is what I think," uh, "This is," you know, and so on. Those are all gone now, of course. Everything is is done completely differently. Right. So, well, Dave, what do you think about the S&P today? Got any thoughts? Want to share with us? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, well, a couple things. First of all, those people that have been to our Reflected Wave course know about the daily top that is due tomorrow. And um, the S&P showed some uh, potential sign of weakness because uh, yesterday uh, we had indicated that the market, if it got above 2094, would run to 2098.99 and then it would test or attempt 2105. And on the Globex, they got up to 2103.75, about a point and a quarter below 2105. For that to happen, and the market be putting in a daily top that's due tomorrow, is interesting. You know, I'm I'm not ready to say that that absolutely, you know, it wasn't a roadmap, it wasn't something, but it, it still has, to, you know, I still have to take it into account that that has some meaning, and. Um, so with the daily top that's due tomorrow, with today having reached important prices, you know, important turns occur, important prices, and that whole thing, I do have to take it seriously that, that we're pulling back here. We did earlier today, um, right shortly after the open today, indicated that uh, in today's third hour, we would expect a retest of 2092 to 2090. So in, to, in the first hour, we had already hit 92.75, and we were on our way up. And we indicated that uh, the market should not be able to close hourly above 20.99 before testing 20.92 to 20.90 in today's third hour, right in that time frame. And we did. You can see if you look at today's market, we we swung up. Uh, in the second hour, and we went to 20, uh, 125, but we didn't close above it, and uh, the market then turned down. And in the third hour, we made a low of 20.93, and in the fourth hour, one hour late, we did the 20.92 slash 90. We got down to 91.50. This is a very important level for us. the The completion of this is very important, 
And so I am of the mind that if we close hourly, which we already did in the fourth hour, but if we close this hour above uh, the 2090 to 2092 area, that has to be taken as somewhat bullish. I mean, I, I have to read that as somewhat bullish. So I'm not ready to just jump in on this yet for certain reasons, but they are testing that level now, the 2092 and 90, and we're, we're at 92.75. So uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, our outlook on the S&P is, is that tomorrow is the on-time day for a top. Today is one day early. We've The market's acting normally uh, because it's gone down and done, done the uh, third and fourth hour test of 93, 92, excuse me. And uh, if they firm up at these levels, I then, even though we have a daily top coming tomorrow, I then could find myself, you know, issuing buy signals and so on like that for uh, some kind of an advance from here. So I hope that's... Richard, Richard K. Uh, Richard, I'm not sure. Is this a, a question or, or a comment? Uh, ES, weekly above slash below 2091. Daily above slash below 2087. He may be saying that those are the time frames and price levels that he thinks are important okay. uh, on gotcha. their close or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I do. Is that is that oh. right, Richard? Is that is that what you were uh, were intimating there? Yes, he said that's correct. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, so it, it right now it looks like the daily top occurred one day early. If you look at your daily chart, it certainly looks like we've put that top in, and. I have to say, uh, uh, kind of along with what he just said, which kind of triggered me, which is this, that we have a yearly top, which is one year late for the year 2015. We recently had a uh, weekly reflected wave top. Those of you that have been following, you know that we had a weekly reflected wave top um, back on like the week of July 20th. And now we have a, and that's inside and subsequent to the yearly, and now we have a daily top inside and subsequent to the weekly. Um, that's bearish. That is not a bullish set of conditions. So if we close today below 2100, uh, basically I'm just adding a point to that 2099 level that we talked about earlier, um, then you know I'm pretty sure the daily top probably came in and that leaves the market for our in our work in a bearish position. So uh, as, as long as we're talking about this, we might as well also, because someone's going to ask about the Russell, um, because we were on someone, your program. Someone, you know, already, right? someone already did. Oh, all right. Well, and it's fair enough, because uh, the Russell is something that we had uh, given out a forecast on. We updated that forecast in our live meeting over the last couple of days, um, or the, over the, yes, well, I forgot, was it Friday? I forgot when we did that, but I think it might have been on Friday. Mm, I think so, Dave. Uh, the 14th, yeah. So we were looking for the Russell to have a nice fast up move and potentially complete uh, at 12:29. We're, we're kind of new and to the Russell. And it did from Friday, because uh, on Friday we rallied. Uh, we had a two-point rally per car. <laughs> That's per what we car? had okay. when we had our car discussion. You know, how, yeah. how many right, Russell right, right. contracts can yeah. you fit in a uh, railroad yeah. car? How many? Uh, anyway, so uh, we updated it on, in our meeting recently and said, "Listen, the first important target on the upside is 2324, and then you know you have to book something at that level." We reached the 24 level today. We got up to a high of 2480, and um, this also is honestly a little not. It's not totally worrisome, but it's a little concerning be, for in terms of the strength or weakness in the Russell. Um, I'm relatively new to the Russell, but I've been around a couple times with it. We may have done six or seven trades in the Russell over the years. But the thing about the Russell is is that it should be really easy for the Russell to get through that 24 and go finish 29, and it has not been. Mm -hmm. So you have to take you know this new evidence. You know they, They've had a pullback here. We'll see if how they handle it. Um, but that's what the market is. It's a series of vignettes so to speak you know what I mean by a vignette it's like a mm -hmm. like a little like like in a play they have little scenes and these scenes get played out in the market and each one has evidence in it that helps you to understand the likelihood of the next vignette how it's going to play out and so on and so um, 
I kind of think of it that way, and you know, the detective story where you're getting more and more information until you can finally say, listen, I have enough information, go arrest this guy, or I have enough information, the market's going to, you know, the market's likely going to do this certain thing. So with regard to the Russell, uh, under, as far as we're concerned, the normal thing was that it should have moved up starting on August 14th, and it should have continued up to 1228 to 1230, and on the way there, it should have had some reaction anyway to 1224. It has, but it hasn't. It we're a little we're running a little late for them to complete the 1229, and so with that mixed with the S&P not quite reaching 2105, you know, I'm building I'm building a case. That's what I'm doing. I'm constantly building a case in the market for what the next thing is likely going to be. And that's why I've said before that it takes it would take somebody practice to do what we're talking about because it is principled, but you have to put the information together. The market isn't going to solve itself for you. You have to solve the market. And that means that it's going to give you the information, but it's not going to solve itself right in front of you. You have to take that information and sort of solve the puzzle for that vignette, for that set of conditions. And so that's the skill, at least in our work, that's the skill. And I think for most technicians, on some level or another, that's the skill, is taking the information that the market's giving you and solving it for those conditions and saying, this is what most likely is going to happen. So it's just whatever degree you're able to do that at, you know, and that that is what we're trying to improve. And I'm still trying, I'm trying to improve my use of it as well. There's a lot I don't know, and it, it irritates me, to be honest with you, uh, of what I don't know. Because <laughs> when I run into something that a situation comes up in the market that I don't, I, I say to myself, well, I don't know, then I have to, you know, my brain heats up. I have to figure out how to deal with that part that I don't know and still come up with the best possible thing that's going to happen. So the more you know, the more you understand, the more principles you understand, the less of those not knowing periods you'll have and the better the, you know, the better you can put together your forecast and your trade and so on. So I, I to this day, I know that people, there's many people that believe that, you know, the technical side of the market is you just go click, 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 and there's your solution. But that's just for the cheap and easy stuff. As you get into deeper solutions, deeper meaning more comprehensive solution for the market, it isn't it isn't that easy. I sometimes struggle quite a bit with. I mean, after the fact, I show it and say, "Look what we said. Look where it went." But I often do struggle, literally, with. I just can't figure it out, and I have to, you know. Sometimes I just let it go, and sometimes I'll say, "Well, I'm just." going to try to go in deeper and figure out what, with what I do know, what would be the most likely thing to happen here. It isn't just click, 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 though. It's not that easy. You can't just throw some indicators on and say this, this is the solution to a deeper puzzle. The deeper puzzle solution isn't solved by the market. It's solved by you. And you have to step in there, use your best knowledge, and sometimes it's easier than others, and sometimes it's harder, and the market's as big as life, so it's always going to be somewhat different, and um, it's a skill. It's simply a skill. It's something that just if you keep doing it over and over again, you get better and better at it. But I, and then my final thought here is that I have said many times that I think the market, the expression of the market, the ups and downs in the market is independent in terms of our work of uh, the fundamentals and even the traders themselves, you know, the, the big boys or the little people, whatever it is, the market itself is going to go to where it needs to go, kind of independently of considering the participants and considering the news and so on. Uh, that's a pure technical viewpoint of the market. But in spite of having said that, I have thought about many times whether or not the market participants themselves in evolving, in growing in their understanding of principles of the market, if the market itself would change its expression because of the constantly evolving nature of uh, the people involved in the market. And so wouldn't the answer to that question be yes, that it would change because of the evolution of the people in the market? And I would think that the answer would be yes. 
but I don't yet have any evidence that that is the case because I can go back, I have data that goes back like anybody does on their platforms, but we can go back into the 1920s and 30s and I can apply you know, today's methodology, what we're doing back then and the market was acting the same then as it was in the 60s and then in the 70s and 80s all the way up till now. So it's kind of a philosophical question. Do the participants themselves and their constantly evolving knowledge really change the market? And my answer would be I thought yes. I don't have evidence of it yet, but maybe one of the answers is is that people aren't evolving. That's possibly one of the answers is that people's understanding of the market really hasn't evolved very much from a hundred years ago. Because to me, if the participants evolve <clears throat> and they're the ones that are trading in the market, it seems like that would certainly have a direct correlation to the nature of the market. I don't know. But my only other answer is, is that um, there may be some participants that have, but not enough. And maybe that's what the thing is, that the mass herd of people that buy and sell in the market um, are doing essentially today what they used to do a hundred years ago, the same kind of stuff. And that's probably, that might be closer to the truth as to why the market <clears throat> isn't more difficult now than it was. In other words, it's still doing the same kind of moves that it was doing back then differently, but still the principles are still effectively working. So I don't know. I have a lot of questions and not so many answers. James so. says, uh, scientists have now discovered that we did not evolve from apes, but we are evolving into apes. <laughs> now that is funny. <laughs> That's good. There really is evolution, mm. <laughs> except the other way. Um, Let's see. Uh, Timothy asks, on the S&P last week, oh, on the S&P was last week or last Wednesday, a 12 a daily or weekly bottom. We had such a strong move off of 46 and then yesterday off 75. Yeah. Um, what What is the question though directly? Was last week uh, a weekly bottom or was last Wednesday 812 a daily bottom? Um, well a couple things real briefly. The, the the Russell did have a weekly bottom a little I while back. He's, he's talking about the S and P. I know, I know, and I was just going to say though, just 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 commenting because I had the Russell up. The okay. last weekly bottom we had was the week of July sixth, and that is a pretty important bottom that the market is still has not violated. As a matter of fact, um, the market overall is still in a very good position here. Um, so the last bottom is the week of July 6th. That's the, in terms of reflected wave, that's the last important bottom. So I hope that answers this question. I don't know if uh, that does or not. He had some other stuff in there, but... Um, uh, and then, the other stuff in there was, let's see. I'll just read the whole thing again. On the S&P was last week or last Wednesday, a daily or weekly bottom. We had such a strong move off of 46 and then yesterday off of 75. Uh, the 46, I'm trying to look for the bottom at 46 in the S&P. I see a bottom at 56. I see a bottom at 62. Uh, it was on August Oh, oh right, right, right. I'm 12. sorry. Yeah. August 12. Yeah, I was going back too 46, far. 50 is what I've got. Well, that wasn't a daily reflected wave bottom. The last daily reflected wave bottom was on July 27th. And although that was a bottom, reflected wave doesn't call every bottom on a particular time frame. But it does the ones that it does call. You would be wise to uh, pay attention to. It is calling for a top though now, and that top is uh, due on August 19th and and may have occurred, and I think probably occurred one day early. So, so there you are. But anyway, it's all very back interesting. to the conversation you were having about uh, just a, just a moment ago. Steve V says the participants are a lopsided demographic. For instance. I trade one or two or three contracts. The other participants who are trading with thousands of full contracts and multiple fast computers and mm -hmm. pre-programmed algos, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I guess what, when, when you speak of the market participants and have they evolved or evolved. not, I guess right. what he's saying is that the participants themselves are, are very varied in, in who they are and how they trade. 
Well, and even more what he's saying is that it's, it's very lopsided, that, that the market consists of a greater number of these uh, people who are trading large sets of contracts based on algorithms and computers and high-speed trading than the others who may indeed have involved, but they're trading five-lot contracts or ten lots or something, but that no match for the elephant in the room which are electronic trading. And the interesting thing again would be that is electronic trading itself, we, you could say electronic trading certainly must have changed the market and I'm sure that it did, but it didn't change it enough uh, to make it, in fact, if anything, the electronic trading has made the market appear to work better. The liquidity that electronic trading has seems to make the market work better than it did before electronic trading where you had the floor and you had the big gaps and all that stuff, um, I think the market has improved and the ability to uh, you know, correctly know what the next vignette is going to be has actually improved because of a larger number of participants and, and electronic trading and so on. So it's a very interesting phenomena. You know, people, you know, it, it could be, a certain person could spend their life studying any one thing in the whole universe. You know, there's, everything is deep. There's no, no, there's nothing that isn't deep. Everything's deep. Uh, a, a door to a room is deep. You could study a door for a whole lifetime. I know it sounds strange, but <laughs> there's so much in there. You could, there isn't anything in creation that isn't deep. Uh, it's all deep. I, well, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, sounds like sound, sounds like you uh, spent the weekend with Dr. Tim. Dr. Tim, who's that? <laughs> Dr. Timothy, Timothy O'Leary. Oh, Timothy O'Leary, yeah. Um, well, I, people have said that about me for a long time. <laughs> um, I work at thinking outside the box. I make an effort to think outside the box, and I've gotten uh, in later years. I've I make a practice of trying to do that uh, because I found that. Um, uh, a, a single perspective rots over time. It gets bad like fruit or like mm -hmm. vegetables. If you are only looking at things from a single perspective, that will end up going stale and it stinks. It just doesn't work. You have to learn, in my opinion, you have to learn to view things other than your habitual way, which is a very narrow slice of the whole spectrum. And if you can start to do that, whether it's in the markets or in other areas, you'll find that um, you have a much fuller uh, life, you know, to be honest with you. So, uh, Ed T wants to know if you had a time to check on a bottom, uh, if a bottom is due in beans, soybeans. Uh, I looked at it earlier today and I'm not, um, I don't have anything new. I mean, you may have something, Dwayne, but I, I don't have anything new to, to add to uh, the soybeans just at this time. I know they started lower today and um, it's interesting I mean I'm interested in them uh, I might be able to make a comment about them just briefly I don't know how valuable this will be but um, I'm of the belief generally this is not a done deal yet but I'm kind of thinking at this point that if the soybean market can stay above nine dollars and four cents and we did test that today uh, we got down to 902 if we close today above 904 and if we opened tomorrow above 904, then I would have some indication for a uh, tradable up move in soybeans that I think would be uh, nice. So I don't have it all worked out yet. And again, th that's the reason it's easy for me to say that and sometimes people say, well, why don't you just know the number? Because it's not a fixed number. It's like it's like the ocean. You know, you can't put an X in the water and say, well, we'll come back to this spot tomorrow or something. You know, it's moving. It's a fluid thing. And in order to capture the reality of the market, you, you have to look at what it's actually doing m m over and above simply using simple targeting methods. You know, there's nothing wrong with simple targeting methods. They often work. But in our work, we need more than that, and so I have not yet worked out what those numbers would be. That's what I'm working on now. So just keep in mind the 904 level. If we close above 904, and I could make an allowance for a slightly lower one, 904 to 902, if we close above that today, open above that, or trade above that tomorrow, then I think we may have something on the upside in soybeans. Until then, um, uh, we're flat and we're waiting. Okay, very so. good. 
Yeah, if we take out the lows of today, then we're looking at our big bean number, which is down at, I just put it up here, uh, 884. But we do need to take out these lows of today. Otherwise, we're going to turn and start running for the number on the upside. But if this, this, if this clears out, then, and so our low today, what was it? It was 902.50. Nine oh yeah, nine oh two fifty was the low today. Okay. Yeah. Um, I right. do want to mention this. Joel just texted me again. This is this is uh, this is a thinking man, and he he said something that I think is true. He said electronic trading is just a modern day manifestation of the same underlying human herding instinct. So what electronic trading has done for us is it is it allows us to better express what we were trying to express before that, and so. It's the same markets. It's just a more efficient way of expressing the same human nature. That's a really beautiful explanation for what the electronic trading of today is. It's just merely a better way of expressing the already existing, ever-present human nature that has been around since the beginning of time, all the way up to, you know, today with our electronic trading. So. Okay. David, any comments on gold? And then we'll take a look at your charts. Uh, okay. If you've got any yeah. that you want to show today, we'll take a look at okay. those real quick. Um, Anything on gold? Let me just bring it up real quick. I'm uh, bullish on gold. Um, I know that we're trading at 1116 right now. Um, I can't give away the full thing because this is something that we're in our subscribers, but I am bullish on gold into September. Okay. So I'll leave it at that for the time being. Okay. You see, you got so, some charts? I do give me just a minute to get over there and uh, get them uh, set up. I do have a little something that I'm going to also show you today, which uh, somebody just sent me a few nights ago. I had gone to my uh, uh, high school reunion, and this is the 40th year, where I remember going there, and I, I joked about this. But I'll, I'll get that in just a second. Okay. And I, I went... Uh, in uh, and I I looked I went to the hotel where it was being handled and I I couldn't find the room originally and I looked in and I I thought well this isn't it this is a bunch of older people <laughs> and uh, that was it <laughs> that's where I belong um, okay so my mom went to her 55th wedding anniversary this past weekend not see, wedding did I say wedding anniversary her 55th yeah. high school reunion yeah this is uh, I don't know if you see this picture or not yeah but. This is my lifelong friend, Dean Stark, over here on the left. Uh, he went to junior high school with me. Uh, this is another junior high school friend that I have not seen in 44 years, the last time I saw this guy, a guy named Ron Levy. This guy I vaguely remember. He's more of a friend of Dean's, uh, and this guy right here is talking to you. So this was at about midnight uh, on, that, on the uh, night of our uh, 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 high school reunion there. Anyway, you look different than you did in that uh, uh, the last time I saw you. Um, you got a different haircut, or no? I, I don't know. You just, look a little different. Well, you know, you have to get to know somebody and all their different, uh, you know, all their different fluctuations. All right. Um, hopefully, better looking. That's all I have to say. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, so I don't know if we don't have a no, lot. No, you don't look any. It's not that you look any old or anything. It's just maybe it's the angle, maybe it's the lighting. Yeah, uh, perhaps. Sorry. Yeah. Um, all right, so with regard to the S&P, uh, this uh, – I wanted to – oh, this was this morning over here that uh, where we were talking about uh, – th we were looking for a third-hour test – of 2092 to 2090 is expected. The market should be unable to close above 2099 before this occurs. Well, they went straight up to 2099, tested it. This is just a 10-minute chart. And then we have certainly now, you know, we've even gone lower. We did the 2092. Today's low is now 2090.25. So we felt that it was between 2092 and 2090 that they would test in the third hour. They did it in the fourth hour and uh, completed it. Uh, over in the middle here, uh, this was gold Friday. Last Friday, gold should firm up on 11... 12 to 11 11 and then test 11 19 into early next week so they sold off to get down to 11 12 here and 11 11 and then they rallied to 11 19 they made a high of 11 19 30 um, which was on the 17th 
of uh, that was uh, Monday, if I'm not mistaken. That's in gold. This was S&P over here. Hourly close above 2094 will advance to 2098, 99, and then advance to 21 at or near 2105. This is 2094. This was the 2098.99, and this is why we're interested because they got to 2103.75, <clears throat> and that could be obviously that could be weakness, you know. And from there, this is where we are now. So, and that ties in with a daily reflected wave top. I might have one or two others. I'm not going to go through everything. This was the Russell that we talked about. This was on your program on Friday. Uh, by a daily close above 12.09 for an advance to 1229, but in our group we threw in the 1224 uh, target, the initial target of 1224, uh, which they did reach, and this is them selling off. And honestly, we're probably going to get stopped out of any remaining position. We're ahead of the, the whole trade now with our thing, but it's likely we're going to get stopped out of that if they go much further. Um, I'll save the rest for tomorrow or something because I know we're running over here. I don't know if you have somebody else coming on, Dwayne. Yeah, Jonathan's coming on here. Yeah, uh, okay. Just a minute, but go ahead. You know, I mean, take your time. No, it's fine. Up, I, I got, I'll, I'll, we'll save them for tomorrow and then in the following days and stuff. Okay. Um, we have a few days left till uh, Friday. So. Yeah, we do. Today's uh, it's early in the week. Well, we just got a new hourly candle. Now, last hour, we managed to get down to 2090 and a quarter. Our little radio trade here is to be short below 2090, and so we got to 2090 and a quarter. And I know that was a support area. 2090 uh, was a support area for Mike Reed, and it's also I think you, you said it was an important number for you too, right? Yes, it is. 20, 92 to 90 is our important level there. Okay. So so basically, what I've suggested here, guys, is that if we if we break that number, you know. I see that as, a, as an important support number as well, but if we do go below it, in other words, if we break it, then I would want to be short down to about, as I said earlier, 2085. So that's if it breaks. If it doesn't, as we leave the show today, if that hasn't happened, then I will give you something to work with on the upside. But for now, the market still looks like it wants to go down and at least touch 2090. And, and to someone who hasn't been around us for any length of time. That's got to just sound like the strangest thing in the world. Somebody that's new to trading or has traded on a whisper, but the market wants to go down and touch a number. I mean, I even sometimes, I've said it so many times that I don't think about it, but when I do stop to think about what I just said, it's like, that sounds kind of weird. Uh, but yet, we we see it and we know it, and, and it is. So, I don't know. I don't know if I can get any deeper than that. But, I mean, doesn't it look like that's what it wants to do? Are you talking to me about where it might go if it, if it breaks the 2090 or something? No, I'm just saying, doesn't it look as if the market wants to go down and touch 2090? Uh, oh. It got down to 2090 and a quarter, and now we just oh, got a I brand see. new hourly candle on the Globex chart, and, and it's showing red. It's like, you know. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah. In other words, just the fact that we're seeing some red now doesn't look like it kind of wants to go down. Well, yeah, I'd be careful in my own mind about that. I, if I have a real forecast target for a specific number, then I can say they need to touch it. And often they don't look like they're going to go touch it, and then they go do it. Um, but, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, the candle's kind of red. It looks like they want to go press it. And yeah, I mean, the, I, I've said that, you know, if, if we can break 2090, then I've got to trade on the short side. But Mike, okay. but Mike comes and says, well, I've got 2090 as support, and I think for you, 2090 is sort of a support number, right? It's tentatively, it's the ending of a important uh, yeah. move, so it, it there's importance here, and I would think that even if Mike said that it was support, I think what he would also finish that sentence and say, if it was broken, it would be meaningful to him as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you so know. I think we're all kind of saying the same thing, and the yeah, market that's what is, and the market is backing us up. I mean, it's because it, it came within a tick of touching 2090. It came within two ticks of breaking it, and so we'll see what it does this hour. So, yeah, I'll send you a, a postcard. Okay, from the, from the edge. <laughs> hey, uh, did you see the pictures of the count of the state fair in Iowa over the weekend? All the candidates uh, were no, out. I didn't. Uh, everybody was having pork chop on a stick. Is that a new thing? That that somehow missed me in life? Pork chop on a stick? 
Uh, you know they sell some crazy things to eat at the state fairs. Uh, they, they'll put anything on a stick. Uh, uh, but there were pictures of, uh, let's see, Hillary and uh, all of them, the whole bunch. Now, the only ones that didn't uh, actually do a speech, I think, were Hillary and Donald. Everyone else addressed the crowd in some way or another. But Donald and Hillary just walked around eating pork chops on a stick. Okay. Um, Steve, we'll answer that. I'll let David answer that question tomorrow. Uh, well, let me. I'm not sure. Steve V says, "What is the reflected wave? Reflective wave? It's a reflected wave." And then you said it almost have and rejected it at the moment. So I think you were just referring to the 2090. Uh, but David can give you a kind of a, just a thumbnail very brief, sketch of the yeah, reflected it's just, wave. It's a method. The reflected wave is a turning point methodology that we use to forecast tops and bottoms in the market. And it's a mechanical method, but for being mechanical, it's very, very highly usable and is a very uh, accurate way of knowing when future tops and bottoms are going, to, are going to occur. It doesn't call every single top and the bottom of the market. But it's really good, especially when you get skillful with it and use it on different time frames. You can put together some very, very um, good trades. So uh, uh, that's something we teach. You know, we, we've taught it. We don't have seminars now for it, but we, we I think we gave 12 seminars uh, at the Mirage Hotel in Reflected Wave, and we're, um, you know, we have a new seminar that's coming up, and you can check that out as well. But it's on a different subject matter. Two final questions, both from Ed T. Are you still bullish the British pound, and are you still bullish the dollar, and do you have any important buy levels close by? Well, the British pound, I have to say, has been very tricky. I'm going to, we're going to show that chart tomorrow. Um, the British pound has done some very unusual uh, behavior here over the last couple of days. Not super unusual, but unusual enough to make it difficult to trade. And I would be cautious with the British pound just at this moment. Um, but we would be bullish on the British pound with continued with daily closes above 156.25. We're at 156.60 right now, so it seems likely that we're going to get that uh, close today. But um, if we're if we're going to get into it again, we're going to get into it at different uh, levels, and so we haven't we haven't worked that all out yet. What was the other question? The British pound and what else? The dollar, the U.S. dollar, yeah. Yeah, we're still we're still relatively bullish. Uh, we are on the U.S. dollar. I think we're still in a trade right now uh, in the U.S. dollar. Okay. So we still are, yeah. Well, David, thank you, sir. Well, thank you very Appreciate much. It. We'll see you guys uh, back here tomorrow. Okay. And uh, uh, stay out of the hot weather if it's if it's hot where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Use an air conditioner. Oh, let me see if I still got a blank screen. Remember yesterday on my iPhone, I had a blank screen for Phoenix. Uh, let's see uh -huh. if it's reappeared. It has. Okay. Uh, today it's only going to be 108, so that's uh, something to get excited about. And uh, to, in fact, uh, Saturday we've got a high of 102. Now that's pretty livable. And then yeah. Sunday it bounces back to 106. So. Well, there you are. Well, thank you very much, Dwayne. I'll see you guys right, uh, tomorrow. Thanks for the questions. Have a great we'll see afternoon. You, you too. Bye-bye. All right, guys. We're going to go to Jonathan now. He's standing by. He has um, – let me find him here. Oh, I thought he was here. Jonathan, what name did you log in under? Oh, there you are. Um, just the. Uh, I got you. You're in. Okay. Hey, welcome to the show. Yeah. Hey, good morning. How are you? I had forgot that I'd sent you a panelist link, and so you're able to just log right in. So good. I can just log right in. You gave me the power. Beautiful. So what's going on? You're uh, not much. Just uh, running around this morning. A lot of a uh, lot of errands and and things to to accomplish as uh, trying to um, open another another uh, portion of business so I do apologize for getting here late oh no problem um, so now in this business it's, it's going to be an auction house which is something you had talked to me about leasing our property downtown for but mm -hmm. I was really set on selling it so have you looked at a lot of uh, different properties to oh, use yes. for this? And, yeah, oh my gosh what's the holdup are prices too high or 
the term's not right, right or size or yeah yes to basically all the all the questions there um, uh, because uh, of the size that, that I need or want meaning I want to be a little over 10,000 square feet probably between 10 and 14 um, you really need some industrial space uh, industrial space is not always in the nicest area of town right. and then a lot of industrial space doesn't have enough parking and then some industrial space have CCNRs which preclude doing auctions so it's been a it's been a long process of uh, of hunting and searching so, and now why and, do uh, they why do they exclude or why are they against uh, I don't. I, I don't really know. Meaning, I I, I would assume that um, it's it's a business that has uh, has maybe some negative connotations. I'm not sure. Meaning, um, for it to be written out of certain certain CCNRs, there must be something about it uh, that uh, um, certain organizations and or neighborhoods or otherwise don't want to have um, in their area. Hmm. But uh, so yeah, I found it in two different. Um, uh, two different locations where we got down to uh, doing uh, LOIs and otherwise, and then as I read through the um, the CCNRs, found that um, that it was not something that was allowed within the context of the CCNR for the area. Boy, this so it's, it's, really it's got me uh, process. It's really got me curious. Why do disallow auction houses? Now, you know, an auction, A-U-C-T-I-O-N, auction. Mm, that's not going to give me the answer that I was looking for. No, I mean, there, there are different season. kinds of auctions, so there's some, there, you know, there's some concerns. So a lot of times they'll limit that uh, you're not going to sell firearms. Um, that's, that's important to some neighborhoods. Uh, vehicles is another thing that, that they want to understand and know. Um, an auction house requires um, multiple trucks. You know, there's traffic in and out. Um, I'm not sure what, exactly why, but I would assume that it would be a, a variety of all those things. Because when I think of an auction, I typically think of it as a positive thing that mm -hmm. you know people want to get rid of their stuff. It's an estate mm -hmm. sale, and so people go there looking for a bargain, and yep. everybody's happy. But I guess there are other types of auctions where you've got repossessed vehicles or mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. items and property Large. that has been uh, repossessed for whatever reason. Yep. And now it's being auctioned off, and so mm -hmm. the original owner might be present and angry and trying to buy his own yeah, stuff. I, I don't know. I mean, I can't, yeah, I just not, can't imagine. Exactly sure. I, I, it doesn't strike me as a rowdy crowd, you know, as everybody gets, let's all get liquored up and go over to the auction house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, so uh, it, it's just uh, something I, I've run into. Been been working on it for about uh, eight months now, as you know, uh, to find the right location. So I, I found places that we could do it, but then I was um, uncomfortable with the geographical location because I want families to come to be comfortable there. There was um, a place you know, on 7th Street that we used to go to, 7th Street between, I think, Thomas and Indian School on the east side of 7th Street. And uh -huh. it was an auction house that was open like every Wednesday or Thursday night. They just had a weekly mm -hmm. auction, and they got this big old sure. huge swamp cooler that, that cooled the place. And it was mm -hmm. basically estate sale kind of stuff. And sure. you could walk around and look at it, and then the auction would begin. The thing yep. I found about auctions is that people get in that frenzy, and they end up – it's like you know, people pay too much because somebody else wants it is – yeah, sometimes you you have you have different kind of buyers at an auction. So you'll have you'll have the uh, collector, mm -hmm. you'll have a retail buyer, and then you also have the resale buyers. So each of them will pay different price points for for an item. So it all depends on on the item itself, and then which which numbers or how many numbers of each group are participating on right. on that piece. So have you watched that show? Uh Storage Wars, is that what it's called? Yeah, Storage Wars. I have wars. seen Storage Wars, yes. <laughs> they're they're lead, those, leading, leading members of our community and or our nation, I would assume. Yeah, those guys are uh, – they picked some real good characters to be on that show. I haven't watched well, an episode in a long time. Yeah, it's pretty good yeah. entertainment. Yeah, the, uh, the only guy I really per personally liked on that show was Barry. 
the, the older guy that would drive all the oh the, all the different vehicles. Cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his was mom a, was on there one time. Yeah, and this was, guy, you know, he just had money. He's out playing. Oh, around. sure. Yeah, he he was an absolute hoot. And uh, then the, the the married couple, they became, uh, you know, they became. Uh, stars in in that realm of, of TV. They've got their own website. Uh, yep. Jared and what's her name? Uh, um, man, I want to say Mandy or, or something like that. I don't know. Storage Wars. Let's see. Jared and Mandy, Mindy. Somebody's, yeah, I'm, sure I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong. Uh, oh, have they got new people? Uh, the 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 black guy is new. The 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 other young girl came off of the Storage Wars show or whatever they called that was in Texas. Oh, the one in Texas. Oh yeah, yeah. this guy here. He is, his attitude. Brandy, there you go. Yeah, Jared and Brandy. Okay. Uh, so now let's see. Jared and Brandy. Well, there's that dyslexia thing again. I never had that as a younger man. So oh, really? They got their uh, own. I've had, yeah, I've had it all my life. Uh, is this it now and then secondhand store? I, I don't know. This is the website for their store. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. there you go. Uh-huh. So, I mean... That's got to help them move some merchandise at their store. All they got to do is just go hang out at the store, because they're you would they're think stars. so, right? People yeah. are going to come. But then there was they had come. another there was another website just. You know, you know I I experienced the same thing. You know, people come to my stores just because I hang out there too. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me ask you. Where do you get? Uh, where does how do you, how does most of your merchandise come to you? Does it come through estate sales and that kind of thing? Well, no, I would say that that most uh, in the consignment stores that we have, most of it comes from people who are 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 having some kind of life change, whether it's um, um, uh, sizing up, sizing down, moving, um, whatever. But something in life is changing, and so they are 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 moving and, and uh, no longer either need or want some of the stuff that they have. Hmm. And so that then they, they contact us and, and we, we say yay or nay and then it becomes, uh, we, we consider ourselves a, a furniture and home decor adoption center. Right. Gotcha. Now you still do the framing business too, right? Yeah, we still do the framing. We we started that almost 20 years ago, so it's it's under the same roof. We do the uh, the picture framing as well as the the consignment. So did you trade this morning at all? I did. You know, and, you and I, I typed in the in the uh, the chat room. I said because you you know you and I have always had this opinion that no matter what kind of methodology you're using, that that um, that oftentimes you're in the same area. So uh, our, our area today was it was at that 90 to 50 area to, to be long off of that. We got there okay. just a little bit before open, but that gave us opportunities. And then we were 2,100 on the, uh, or 21 um, on the high side. Um, so it gave us some, some nice, nice areas to trade off of today, both going up and down. And it was such a kind of like a rangy morning Mm -hmm. It was. It was not. It was. It certainly wasn't directional, as you know. I, I like market profiles, so we certainly weren't. We weren't on any kind of drive day or, or or directional day. So having having those places to use as kind of backboards to trade directionally um, were were very helpful. So coming into the day, uh, here let me break this down on a smaller time frame. Let me go down to about. Oh, 10 minutes. Let me make it an ES chart. Were you trading the S&P? Yeah, the S&P, yes. Okay. So, here we have the 9.30 open. Yeah, so we hit... Um, we hit that, that target area just before open. So, were you trading pre-market? Um, I'm there. So, in other words, um, I think that you know when we started, 
you know, 10 years ago or plus. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the um, the at least from the, as as you know, the gentleman that that I, I first learned from the, mm -hmm. the that time frame was somewhat taboo and not even looked at. But right. whether or not you we would you would believe that now or not, I I think what you can believe or you can understand is that that this type of trading or trading commodities or currency pairs have become truly universal or, or well, we, we trade we trade around the clock in fact yeah. probably the, if you if you ask me the one time a day that I don't trade is probably uh, is 930 Eastern <laughs> you know when sure. every you know when everything's coming unwound from sure. orders that have stacked up overnight stuff sitting yeah. on brokers desk sure. I mean there's a lot of push me pull you going on in that yep. in that first 30 minutes so we had a high um, during that 10-minute period. We had a high of 20.97.75 and a low 20.94. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's just enough whipping back and forth. If you're using a two-point stop, that's just enough to whip you out of it. And um, sure, and it could have still gone in the direction that you planned for it to go. So were you? Did you do you take any kind of bias at all into the market in the morning? Are you looking for higher prices, looking for lower prices? Well, what 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 I use is I use um, uh, some multiple time frames with a market profile to 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 determine which side of the market is 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 pushing the market. Because as you know, we've talked about this. I believe that if um, if if 95% of if we believe the statistics that 95% of retail traders are unsuccessful, then you have to do basically the opposite of the what opposite, retail traders right. are being are being mm -hmm. taught. So yep. I, I'm I'm always interested in what I would consider or think that the the bigger money is doing because we've had this conversation before that these folks that are trading have the account size and the and the things where they can average in they average down they add to positions meaning they're trading completely the opposite of somebody like me that might be trading you know two three or four or maybe even five contracts at a time we just don't have the same luxuries but trying to be able to see from a uh, from whatever thing whatever would give you that context um, where the money is moving or which direction they're moving, then you can get a good idea of where they, if you, you truly believe like I do, the market is driven by by greed and fear, then you can see where where some people are going to get greedy or that they're fearful of having missed or uh, afraid of not being able to, to stand up to their, their compadres when they have to report each day's earnings, um, where they might participate or not and which direction that they're going. Because you can be certain that most outside of rogue traders and, and those guys that are true contrarian thinkers, that the, most of the big money is on the same side of the market. Um, pushing to, to certain levels that they've they've identified as a group and or the trading desk has identified as a as a as a target area. I broke it down to a two minute chart from uh -huh. ten so we can really see inside of that what happened and so that first two minute bar uh -huh. two minute candle was down and then we were up for four minutes and that took us from twenty ninety four up to 97.75, mm -hmm. so that's three and three quarter points over a four minute period of time. Certainly, time for our guys to to get their points for the day. Here, this is more where I'm comfortable coming into the market. About 15 minutes. I like to let this this first 15 minute jittery kind of a thing get out. Although, if you're on the right side of the trade, I mean, there's certainly sure. the energy and movement. It's a beautiful time to get your points for the day and be done. But here we can see that the market has started. Now, of course, this is after the fact. It's always easy to see things after the fact. But sure. the market made a move higher. Yep. And so we put in a you know leg and a retrace and a leg and a retrace sure. and a leg and then a deeper retracement, and then we continued. Yep. Now, yeah, go ahead. Oh no! I was just saying that. Yeah, so not not that much different. Um, um, well, I was in at six four, or we were in at six forty six, uh, right at that about that time frame. Yeah, so nine forty six Eastern. Yeah, 
Um, so yeah, right, right in that that area, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and hopefully you're wrong. Up a little bit. The, yeah, the whole the market played up a little bit, but we were looking for it to pull back down into that 93 area. So it had the initial push up, and then it came back down very nicely right to that to that 93, 93.50 area, um, 92.75, and then then we went ahead and, and executed from there. And so 11.40. Okay. Yep. You got it, sir. Yeah, so as as we we've we've had these discussions before. So you waited you waited out this this whole area here as it was moving um, higher. Yeah, let me pull up your your screen here. I'm I'm look, I was looking at mine. Um, so from nine because yeah. nine forty two, it didn't pull we didn't pull back into that ninety three area until. No, I I, I, tr I traded it at. Um, yeah, I entered. Let me see. If I can look at my book right here. Um, I entered the I entered the market at at six forty six and twenty eight. Oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. Okay, okay. So you're talking about twenty ninety three when the market, right after the market opened. Okay. Yep. Because it, yeah, it, so it moved it higher up, and then it came yep. back to that same level, and yeah. and then moved higher again. Yeah, I I was I was looking to get in um, over here at like six thirty two, but it never came down to to, to the price. So um, we we didn't we didn't get a, here. a way to enter. Gotcha. Um, but then it pulled. It went up and it pulled right back down and gave us uh, what we thought was was the the great entry. So we uh, we traded there. And 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 what what that just goes to show, like we we've talked about before, is mm -hmm. that that's irregardless of what methodology you're using or or where or how you're trading. Most of these areas, once you've had the screen experience and the the capacity, are going to be pretty much in the same areas. Right. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. No matter. They're, they're going to be, yeah. Now, with our range chart, it mm -hmm. looks slightly different, but it, it looks, as you can see, for those of you that look at it all the time with us, there's, there's a more, for us, it creates just a little, um, there's a number of reasons that we use the range chart, but is there's a more fluidity in that every candle is exactly the same height. We know where the next candle will open or close. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how long it's going to take, but we know at what price the next candle will open. And so here we have that same move down into the 930 open right here, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. that leg up, and then the move down into 94. And then we get over to that time frame where you were looking for, which was the 93 right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where it handed it to you. And then leg up to 95. So from 93 to 95, if you were just looking for a couple points, that was it right there. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think, I think we were looking for 97.50, and I think we bailed a little early. Well, we you got uh, after yeah. this after this pullback here. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you definitely got the 97.50 yeah, at we've been, uh, 10 yeah, at that at that like 9.57 area when we, we we got a little show of weakness there. We went and bailed in that area. I think I think uh, got out around 95.75, 95.50, um, and then of course I got laughed at by those folks that waited for the 97.50 <laughs> as being wimpy. <laughs> Because it went right to where we we were we had the target right. base on, but uh, that's the way it is. Yeah, like yeah. it's like I've said to 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 all the time, it's it's not your entry that makes you money; it's your exit. That's true. That's it's true. Anybody exit. anybody can enter a trade. It takes yeah. it takes little to no experience to click. Absolutely. Them. So your exit is always where you make your money. Yeah. So we had, and so. Where are we now? Because the market may that we may have gotten as close as we're going to get to that 2090. See, here we got to 2090 and a quarter. Now it's pushed all the way up to 2095. Mm -hmm. So I may be leaving you guys with a long trade at the end of the show today because we were going to consider short below 2090 if the opportunity presented. It did not. 90 and a quarter was as low as it could go so far. But then look at it this way. Here's a leg and a retrace, and a leg, and this may be nothing more than simply another retracement before the next leg down. 
Mm-hmm. So how, now, how do how do we know? Well, I don't know that we know no, but we can get a pretty good idea of where we're at if we just come here and we plot this on. Okay. And so as we were coming down, we had a bearish cross, price pulled away, price pulled back, down close. We had a, we had a move down into that 92 mm -hmm. area, and then now we've turned around and started building our legs in the other direction. There's a leg and a retracement, then a leg. And so if we pull back into this area here, we would expect another bounce. And we've got potential resistance here at 95 and a quarter, and then up at 96.50 and then beyond that it's up up and away now on our big picture earlier I said we had no trigger is that still the same case let me look 20 the alert for today or no that was or for last night yeah last night the S&P Long above 2105, there's still no touch there, and short below 2090. Okay, so that I knew that 2090 sounded familiar. So that's below 2090 is the alert from last night. So those of you here on the show today that aren't on the alert list, you got that anyway. But we're still trapped in between those two, 2105, 2109. Actually, what I'm starting to think about now is this swing high here. I looked at it earlier. I really would want to be a point above these tops, which would put me at about 20.99, and that is two points, or no, it's only one point up to 2100, and the potential for resistance is too, it's too much there, and so there really isn't a good long trade, not something that I can leave you with confidence in other than what we put on for the day, which was to be long above 2105. So, in headlines today, Walmart's got a problem uh, mm -hmm. with uh, only only one. Well, it says that their profits are down. One, their profits are down because they're giving their employees a living wage. Shame on them. Um, mm -hmm. But it's got it's long overdue and. Um, I mean, it's it's not like they're struggling to make a profit. They're they're, they do, they're doing really well, uh, although their profit fell to three point four eight billion, or a dollar eight a share, in the quarter ending. Now that's in the quarter, right? We're not talking about the whole year. That's just the quarter, ending July thirty first, from four point oh nine billion, or a dollar twenty six a share, uh, same time last year. Now company says the problem is theft. We know that part of their problem is the fact that they're paying their employees uh, uh, more money now, or a quote-unquote living wage. But Walmart President Greg Foran said Tuesday that theft, which the company called shrinkage, was one of three major factors behind the retailer's drop in profit in the most recent quarter. Inventory shrinkage was meaningfully higher than planned for the quarter. Walmart probably loses about 1% of its U.S. revenue, or roughly $3 billion a year, to stealing by customers and employees. That's a huge number. Sure. $3 billion a year. Have you ever had a business where you had employees where you had to be concerned about that? Sure. I, I think that when I ran resorts, we, we always were concerned about that with uh, when you have uh, supplies and, and, and goods in, in multiple areas and, and you can't, you can't uh, I won't say control it, but you, you don't have the capacity to be everywhere at one time. Um, it, is, it is a true concern. I mean, it's, it is part of the... Oh, that's right. Um, you were in resort situation. management for a while. So... You, <clears throat> So what are, what sort of things do people take in a resort? Uh, well, ashtrays, matches, towels. No, that's that's that that's 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 very little. So what what you'd really be looking at is 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 general supplies. Um, uh, so uh, soap, glassware, uh, food. 
Um, it, it depends. It's different for the pe the customers well, versus now, the Walmart versus says the, that uh, the majority of the of the theft happens in their food department. Sure. Now, is this from people that I mean, are are they are they stealing food because they're hungry? Or are they stealing food because they can? What do you think? Um, I think that that it's it's somewhat almost cultural now that that it's it's okay. Really? Yeah, I think that um, that when when we talk about companies like Walmart and we start to say, look at how much money they made, 3.4 billion, and and even though if you didn't mean it, there was there was almost I won't say disdain or disgust in your voice, but it was almost <laughs> like like the greedy. The it was greedy it was jealousy, man. I was yeah, just okay. jealous. That's all. <laughs> but I, I I mean so so when 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 we have a cultural attitude like that toward a business. Mm -hmm. Then, if you take a, a $10 item from them, it, it's just not that big of a deal. It's why would it be that? Why is it important? You know, yeah. I have nothing; they have everything. Uh, why don't I, I? I deserve this, or or the things. I mean, the whole dialogue about living wage and all that stuff just irks me. Well, to fight back, the company has added a fleet of asset protection customer specialists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the guy who checks your receipt at the door as you leave. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he's, I mean Costco's done it for years. Asset that's protection their margin, customer. I mean, special. Well, I you know Costco's our, margin is is less than eight percent between what they buy and they sell for. So mm -hmm. if, if they had lots of theft, they couldn't stay in business. Yeah. So they've done the, it for years. Walmart recently brought back employees known as greeters to its store entrances to help combat the theft problems and they've also added the so they got them shaking your hand coming in the door greeting you mm -hmm. it's like how you doing we know you're here we're watching you we're glad <laughs> we're glad, but we're glad you're here welcome and then the guy at the door but the guy at the door always gets overwhelmed there's one guy there with a marker and people like he's they're going through my one little bag of, of groceries and then I see two guys you know walk out carrying uh, big screen yeah. TVs. <laughs> Do no, you no, think no. maybe you should check their receipt and, and not my bag? But hey, no. it's okay with me. I'm sure they've got it under control. Uh, their numbers point to it. Yep. What else we have in the headlines today? Let's see. Everybody's starting to cut the cable on cable TV. And sure. are, you, are you part of this movement? No, I, I'm not. Uh, but I know that uh, um, my daughter and most of her friends are. They're, they're uh, what is it? Uh, either Netflix or is it Roku? Roku. Or well, with the or... with the Roku, uh, I've got a Roku upstairs and I've got an Apple TV downstairs. And when the mm -hmm. Roku gives me access to about 300 channels, um, a lot of them are free if you watch the commercials, mm -hmm. and then quite a few of them are paid. Sure. Uh, but with with Netflix, with a Roku device, a Netflix account, and a Hulu account, you can watch just about anything that you want to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one thing that you lose when you cut that cable is with my cable TV, all of the – because the network shows, which is primarily what we watch, we just don't watch them on network time when the network shows right. them. And we don't – and we, don't, and we don't want to watch the commercials, and so we like to record them. And so the cable company gives us a handy DVR. Now, sure. you can, of, of course, go to the store and just buy your own digital video recorder, but you don't have the built-in menu and uh, management that allows you to scan through all the upcoming shows, what time they're going to be on, etc., and you know, just point and click. I mean, with a standalone, privately owned DVR, unless it's TiVo, which has its own menuing system, and there may be some other DVRs out there that I'm not familiar with that come with their own. In other words, you don't know this this box that I buy. Although it'll record hundreds of hours of digital video, it'll record anything I tell it. It doesn't have a built-in menuing system where I can just flip through it and click record this and record the whole season of a particular show. 
Um, well, now I have, I have we have direct TV at my house, and I, I I'm on weird hours all the time, um, but we have, we have the um, a menu capacity to be able to right. To well, with Cox Cable, for, we do, we do too. Yeah, right. with Cox Cable, we can just point and click and tell it to record the whole season of a show. I can search. Yeah, I can search in the future. I can I can and look at things. I can even go into the past and 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 yank things out. So. They're, they're trying to be competitive. They want to stay. They want to stay relevant. Unlike so I, I understand the cutting of the cords. What I don't understand is what people are doing that don't want to have to watch their TV, uh, the, the network shows. If you don't want to have to watch those in real time, how do you overcome that? Uh, now it says here. Let me see. Over the past five years, the percent of households with cable subscriptions has been falling, but with year-over-year -year subscribers still seeing growth. However, modest cable companies were still able to look past what some had seen as a cord as a coming cord-cutting apocalypse. Now it's become a reality. In a note to clients on Tuesday, analysts at Pacific Crest revealed a few jarring trends for the media space, which saw stocks get hammered a few weeks ago after subscriber warnings from ESPN and Viacom. Pacific Crest estimated that the top eight cable providers saw subscriptions fall by 463,000 in the second quarter, up from a decline of 141,000 in the same quarter last year, the firm also estimated that the number of households with cable has fallen 10% over five years, while Netflix has seen the number of households with their service nearly double to 35% since the third quarter of 2011. But perhaps most troubling is the firm's contention that the demand for skinny bundles, which are slimmed down cable packages, appears low with Sling TV Dish Network's over-the-top offering, adding fewer than 70,000 subscribers in the quarter. Meanwhile, Netflix subscriber growth clocked in at 20% over the prior year in the second quarter, while Amazon and Hulu saw subscribers rise 40 and 45% respectively. I mean, this it's really out of control, I think, because my cable TV bill, it's bundled with my digital telephone, Mm -hmm. And I'm at like two hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. I don't. I don't mm -hmm. do HBO. Uh, mm -hmm. My business internet comes on a separate bill. Um, right. So it just it doesn't make any sense that I'm paying two hundred dollars a month to watch TV, and on top of that, I'm paying nine 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 bucks a month or ten bucks a month, whatever it is, for Netflix. And mostly everything we watch is on Netflix. Or oh, we also have Amazon Prime. Sure. But we have Amazon Prime, not for all of the TV and movies. That's just a bonus. We have that because we a lot of the things that we buy on a regular basis, we buy from Amazon because we get a good price. And with the uh, with the Amazon Prime, we get the free shipping. So sure. Do you guys buy stuff from Amazon? Not very often. Um, I, I, my daughter does. Uh, she's she's uh, probably a little more progressive in that in in that area than I am. So um, she she does, but not so much I. Hey, Dwayne, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to. No problem, to, buddy. No, no, no. I know we're beyond we're past time. Oh, no that's problem okay. at all. I, I do apologize for being late today. Oh, that's all right. We'll see you next Tuesday. Yep, my all my right. pleasure. Take care. Be blessed. Bye bye. Okay. All right, guys. I think we're going to wrap it up for today. I was just looking here at this Fire TV, Amazon Fire TV, currently unavailable. They're out of stock. They don't know when they'll be back. This is all part of the cable cutting. This link was in the article that I was just reading. Amazon Fire TV is a tiny box you connect to your HD TV. It's the easiest way to enjoy over 250,000 TV episodes and movies on Netflix. Amazon Instant Video, and HBO Go, plus games, music, and more. With voice search, wow, that's pretty neat. Simply say the name of what you want to watch and start enjoying it in seconds. i got to admit, I don't have that. 
uh, with Roku or Apple TV. Two gigs of memory, 1080p HD, fast quad-core processor, and expandable USB storage. Hmm. Fast quad-core processor and expandable USB storage for playing best-selling games like Minecraft, games of Game of Thrones, Crossy Roads, and more. Now, see, I'm not into the whole game thing. And so, I thought you needed some type of a gaming device. So, is the Fire TV, is it an actual TV set? No, it's a box. It's a tiny box you connect to your HD TV. So, I don't understand how that enables you to play these different games. Or are the games available online, so to speak? Maybe that's what it is. No more waiting for your movies and shows to buffer uh, ASAP learns what movies and shows you like, so they start instantly. Fire TV lets you fling your favorite apps to your TV to free up your small screen for other uses, or you can mirror your phone or tablet to your TV. That's pretty clever. Amazon Prime customers get unlimited access to popular movies and TV shows with Prime Instant Video, including the HBO collection and original shows like Transparent plus Prime Music. Hmm. Now, okay, so my wife has shown me that on there's a lot of places on the internet where they want to sell you this little fire stick. It comes from Amazon, but then they, uh, I guess hack is the only the guy says in the video that I watched, I'm not hacking it, you're paying me for my time. Well, okay, I don't think that's going to stand up in court. Uh, I'm pretty sure that what you're doing is hacking this little device. But he then showed that how after, his after you paid for his time, which I think is 99 bucks, and that includes the stick, uh, you can watch everything, HBO, Showtime. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's theft, so we're not going to go that route. Uh, the new features on the Amazon Fire TV is expandable USB storage on Fire TV. Okay, now this is for downloaded apps and games. All right, I, I guess I just don't get the whole game thing. Connect to your hotel or dorm room Wi-Fi with captive support. Um, all right. Well, we've spent enough time talking about this. You didn't tune in to listen to me talk about watching TV. Minecraft. Okay. They're, they're pun they're, I've, heard some very, I've heard some seriously bad things about this Minecraft. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard it too, but... They say it's not good for your kids. So, I mean, I've seen it. When I first looked at it and, and my son wanted to play it, it just it looked very harmless. But uh, go on some of the Christian sites that review this type of stuff, and they'll tell you it's not good. It's not good. So if you have Amazon Fire TV, you can get Netflix, Hulu, Crackle, Amazon Music. Oh, Looks like all the same stuff that I get on Roku already, Bloomberg TV. But see, if I want Bloomberg TV, I have to pay for it. So that's an additional charge per month. Showtime anytime. Okay, it's available through that device, but you still have to pay for it. It's not all free. Spotify is not free. Twitch. Twitch is where you watch other people play video games. That's how big this video game thing is. So people actually go online to watch other people play video. I don't get it. Sorry. All right, the S&P, uh, it looks like we're at 2093. We just put in a high here at 2095. And so, you know, I'm not going to be able to leave you with a trade, anything I'm confident in, other than what we gave out to our clients, subscribers, 
last night, which was to be short below 2090 or long above 2105. Okay. So let me just put that in here. Consider being long above. It's a pretty quiet week so far. We're short below 2090. F. Long above 25 or short below 2090 if. I mean, we're just we're just trapped in this little area here. Now this is last week's zones, remember that, not this week's. And so those of you that have access to this week's trading zones, you pay attention to those as for your downside target. I've already told you guys if we break 2090, then I think you know the possibility for us to uh, go to 2085 is there. Again, we would just be looking for that two-point move, get our points for the day. But if you were to, you know, trail your stop down to 85, if that trade comes into play, then you'd be right in there with everyone who got that email yesterday morning that has the weekly trading zones. And tomorrow is already Wednesday. I mean, time flies. So tomorrow, by the end of the show or Thursday morning, I'll be putting this week's zones up on the screen. But if we just... I mean, the Sunday night Globex open, I usually highlight that with an arrow. Let me find it. Oh, it's way over here, isn't it? August, yep. Because right there was that little doji was Friday the 14th. And that was Sunday night right there. So from here to here. I mean, that's our week. We've got a low at 74.75, and we've got a high at 2103.75. So I guess it doesn't look like much, but looks are deceiving. I mean, it's 25, 28, eh, we'll call it 30. We could call it a 25 to 30 point range in two days. I guess that's not so bad. Move down, move up. Now, this move down. Uh, if you got that email Monday morning, then you caught this right here, and you were prepared for this. So, said enough already. Watch beans. Let's see what the beans are going to do. Um, See where we're closing or closed? If we open tonight the same spot or lower, now Globex opens at 6 p.m. Eastern, but soybeans don't start trading until 8 p.m. Eastern. All right? And so look for a potential. Let's see where was last night's open. Okay, see my crosshair there? It says 1,400 hours, and then it jumps to 2,000. So that's 2 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Eastern. There's a six-hour gap between these two. And so we closed yesterday here, and then we opened last night here. We ran into the CFMA1 red and falling, and price, this this was the one that might have caused you some concern, okay? Now, if you're looking to take this, if you're looking to take this short down to the big bean number, which is, I thought I put it on this chart, just to put it on a different one. Number again is... 884. I'll do it again. 
must have erased it or something. Eight eighty four. Text, custom text. Big me number. Okay. So, see, if we open lower tonight or flat and we continue down, then here, this is a target to trade to. What would get us thinking differently is if we take out, see how this is tried to run and it got knocked down? So we know that there's good resistance here. I mean, buyers were willing to buy this low at 902. So this is here's your support level. I mean, this is on a on a smaller, on a small scale, this 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 same thought and theory applies to you know daily weekly you know much larger time frames but as price was coming down this morning we hit a spot that buyers were willing to pay that price yeah I need to be up right there oh, really there, close enough. So as price is coming down, we hit a spot that buyers are willing to pay. Okay, but the either buyers just stuck their hands in their pockets and said, "We've got all we want. We're not willing to pay a penny more," or there was some true selling pressure. Okay, someone really, you know, wanting to be heavily short the market in some quantity. Now let's go back over here. Remember we had that big spike down on the WASD report. That's a monthly agricultural report. I mean look how that dwarfs everything else we have going on from a high of 974 that day to a low of 90 as a 70 cent drop. That's like 70 points in the S&P. It's $3,500 per contract. Had you been short, if you got short here and wrote it all the way down, it's 3500 bucks per contract. I didn't. I don't know anybody who did. Okay? So <laughs> let's, not, let's not misunderstand each other. Uh, don't you, why don't you just be straight? There you go. Is that straight? I think so. Okay. So we're inside of this little area here. A break higher. Okay. Where's our next resistance level? Right here. Okay. And then it's kind of staggered. But the next major one's going to be here and then here. So if we open where we closed or gap lower, then good, good possibility that we're going to take a ride down this 884 number all right now don't forget I mean we're right at the area where support showed up on the day of the WASD and said we'll buy your beans at that price and so really getting through this nine dollar area is important now that's a number that David had is important for completely different reasons so it's kind of like the number we all three had on the S&P for different reasons. Uh, again, David's reasoning different than mine for this $9 area. I see it as simple, you know, is it, there's nothing complicated about what I see. I just see that buyers were willing to pay this price, run it up, and demand has weakened since we got the report. There was an initial knee-jerk reaction. We went higher. Leg, retrace, leg, retrace. We didn't get another leg. We get a leg in the opposite direction. So we get a leg 
and a retrace and basically a leg. And we started to try to build, you know, a ret we couldn't even get a good retracement off of this leg down today. That's what this was the beginning of. It didn't happen. So be prepared tonight, okay? And see what we can't do on the downside with this. I will have the alert numbers out tonight, uh, hopefully on time. That's my plan. All right. All right, guys, let me check the chat box, make sure I didn't miss anything. Let's see. David said, not only do they watch, they pay to watch. Oh, um, that's when I was talking about the... Uh, I thought, well, I think on Twitch, David, you know, there may be, there, there's probably different variations. On my iPad, I downloaded the Twitch one time because I just couldn't believe that people were sitting around watching other people play video games. I was able to get into that free. Now, that may have changed. It may have become so popular that people have to have to pay for it. Or there's other, yeah, other applications where you pay. That is amazing to me. It really is. But I guess if you love the game and you want to get better at the game, you... Well, it seems like you'd want to play. Now, I understand multiplayer, you know, you're able to play with somebody in another, you know, geographic area. And uh, just like with any sport, if you want to get better, you play someone better than you. You know, if you want to get better at billiards or ping pong or tennis, you play someone that's a little better than you. And hopefully that helps you to get a little better. But just sitting and watching other people play, I don't know. It's just... Uh, Something unique in this generation. Bart says, I just noticed on the chart you have up the ESU5 on August 14th. You're showing the stop out be a nice feature. Are you going to continue with that? I'm not uh, on the ES chart. Did you mean this ES chart? That's something that I just, I just, during the show, I just highlighted the fact that on that day, um, 2075 was the alert. Let me double check. That was August 14th. So on the night of the 13th, on the night of the 13th. ES short below 2075. So yeah, I do try to point that out on a daily basis as I go through when I show you know where we went. I just noticed that on this one, you know, it only dropped to 2073.75, and so if the trigger 75, we need to get down to at least 73, and that didn't happen. It did move far enough far enough for you, if you're just looking to get your points for the day, if you weren't looking for a big, you know, run, 14 points or 6 points, if you're just looking for your points for the day and you're trading with an 8 tick stop, it did drop far enough uh, here down to 74 to let you uh, move your stop to break even. So... I don't know if you had thought that was automatically generated or, or not, but that was something I had put in. You know that. Well, the thing is, Bart is on a one-hour chart. If you if you choose to just trade a break, okay, like here, if you were going to just trade a break of this 2090, based on nothing more than uh, than that, just a break of 2090, then you really have to kind of look at the chart to see where the next level is. And so see, in this case, you would need to be, gosh, probably up at 2096, which means you need to be looking for more than two points in the move. Unless you understand some of the things that we teach and that is, is that if we get this break of 92, 
just based on what we understand about reading a chart, we think there's a very high probability that we'll, if we break 2090, we think we'll go to 2088. In fact, if we break 2090, I think we'll go to 2085. And so we're, really what we're looking at is, yes, that opens the door for our two points for the day, but it also gives us the opportunity to take five points out of the market. Now that, okay, is it worth risking five to make five? Yeah. Was it be, would it be better to risk two to make five? Absolutely. And so what I would suggest doing is, since we've talked so much about this 2090 number, let's just go take a look at it for a second. Uh, here. We'll do it here. 2095. <clears throat> now, we've got a bearish cross. Now, remember earlier we talked about it was this when we were looking at this earlier, it was here. But now we've got a bearish cross. We're looking for price to pull back. And the number we've been talking about being short below is 2090. But in order to be short below 2090, the number that you're really looking for for your entry would be 20. 8975 because that's the first tick below 2090. Now, we know the average swing in the S&P is 3 to 5 points. So the swing high up here is at 95. And this was at 9050. Okay? So we had a swing. We had a 5 point swing. I would want to see a three to five point swing this way. Okay, so what would that look like? 2090, maybe up to 2093. Okay, so from 2093 to 2095, then we're looking at three to five back down. Okay, see if you count these, it's it just repeats itself over and over. The average swing is three to five points. Okay, the swing low here is 91 and it goes up to let's see what was it again 91 50 up to a high of 93 50 now that was only a two-point move so from 93 75 93 the swing down went to 90 and a quarter and so then this swing went from 90 to 95. So that was the 5. And then it gave us 5 back down. And this swing here had a high of 95, 40, down to 91, 51. So that 3 to 5 points plays out pretty well. And so how does that all play into this down here? Hmm. I think what I'd like to see is, you know, here's the touch right here. Now, since we know this is an important area, this can become like a target, okay? Except I would probably, if I'm using it as a target, I'm going to go 2090. But remember, the, the radio trade was to be short below 2090, and so if I'm using it, if I'm looking for an entry, I'm going to be here. If I'm using that as a target, I'm going to be here. Okay. So what do we need? We need a down close. After the down close, we sell the open of the next candle. We do have the CFMA1 blue and climbing. I would prefer to have that red and falling to coincide with this trade. And so we could let this work itself through another complete cycle so that what happens is we come like this and like this and then we go like this and like this and then it plays right into it, okay? Because if it were to just drop right now, uh, currently price is at 92 and a quarter, call it 92. It's a two-point drop. Now, if it if it if, if it dropped five points, hold on for me just one second.
Okay, sorry about that. I'm back. All right, here, let's throw the... Um, slingshot up there. Let's see what it's got to say. Okay, so we're getting that bearish. All right, so the high of this candle is 2092.50. And so four ticks lower is going to be 2091.50. So that's going to put our entry at 2090 and a quarter. Is that correct? No. 91 and a quarter. The high of this candle, remember we need a down close and then we sell the open of the next candle. So if the high is 92.50, then the low will be 91.50, that's four ticks, and then we would want to get long 91 and a quarter, short, I'm sorry, short 91 and a quarter. So let's watch this for a second and see if it's going to give an entry. Now if we look left, see we've got sort of a double bottom going on right here at 90.50. So this is, a, this is a tough area, this is a battleground. Pop back over to the hourly for a second. You know we can see that price has attempted to get down into this area uh, a couple times now over the last couple of hours, and it's really struggled there. And when you know that you have the potential for something like this, you know it's okay to pass. You know, we don't, we don't, okay, so we got our down close, and that candle opened just as we thought at 20, 91.50, okay, and so you would sell that on a stop. If you were going to participate in this trade, here, this is a demo account, I'll just show you, and so you would sell 20, 91.25, There, just like that, and there's an eight tick stop, and what do I got the target set on in this? Eighty six and a quarter. So it came down, triggered, and we'll see what happens. This is a demo account. So, sitting at break even, at four ticks, your stop goes to break even. CFMA one, oh, I'm sorry, the cycle is red and falling. I would, you know, in a perfect world, the the green line would be up top here, and the cycle is red and falling. I would like to see it point down a little more sharply. Now you see that green line right now it just popped right back up to hit that BBC again. Okay. So now we start that whole process over again. Need another down close. You know and that'll get us through this obstacle. That'll get us below the CFMA1. Well, no, it won't because the high of this candle is 20.92, and so we need to see 20, yeah, 91. Yeah, it would. Sure. Where'd the DOM go? Let me pin it. Click that little pin and your DOM will stay in place. So back to the discussion of what a battleground area this is and the struggle that we know the market has had to get through this area before. I pulled this out, put on the trade just to, just to show you anyone that's not familiar with how to sell on a stop, that's how you sell on a stop. And use a bracket order, okay? Automatically, 
without me doing anything, I have a stop up here at 93 and a quarter. It's an eight tick hard stop. And a 2091 and a quarter entry. And a 86 and a quarter target. So that's uh, what, five points? Yeah. So risking two in search of five. Now that's 86 and a quarter, but remember we talked about the potential target being 85. Okay. This is just how, how this was set up. I do need to run. I'll leave this chart running so that we can see, you know, whatever happens. One or two things will happen. It will go to the target or it will go to the stop. It could go to the stop and then go to the target. Bottom could fall out. It could just, you know, break to the downside. Now, we got an up close here. You know, this candle, you really need to see a down close. If you don't get a down close on this candle, I mean, you're pretty close to being stopped out because the low of this candle is the low of this candle is 91.75. So four ticks higher is going to be 92.75, and your eight tick hard stop is at 93 and a quarter. So, and that looks like where price is going to go and try to stop this out. So. You'll be able to see it happen live here in real time. Again, the object lesson here is if you know you've got an area that is tough to break through, nothing wrong with waiting and letting price break through that first. Because when you, when you know that there is a potential for the market to hang up there and you take the trade anyway, I mean, now think about it. There's a little bit of a little bit of a gambler spirit there, right? No trade is ever a certain thing or a sure thing, and so there we are. Took us out, everything worked just as it was supposed to. Our order triggered, it hit our eight tick hard stop, and there we are. Okay. Now, does that mean it won't come back down and ultimately take out the twenty ninety? Not at all. It very well may. But it's a difficult area. So think about that when, you, when you're going to put a trade on, especially later in the day or even later in the morning, okay? Like once that early morning energy burns off at the open, things sometimes – now look where we're sitting. We're sitting right in – that 9192 zone. Now we've been there since the show opened today. The show opened today right above this weekly zone and we almost almost always open the show whether we whether we've got last week's zones up or this week's zones it's just a, a common thing because those area those are areas that have for lack of a better term sort of a magnetic quality to them. And so that was on the smaller scale, right? Even though we had the ingredients, we had our bearish cross, price pulled away, price pulled back, down close, sell the open. We knew this here was detrimental to the trade, okay? And we knew that we were sitting right at a weekly zone and last week I mean that was just Friday today's Tuesday okay and so is that carryover strength still there absolutely and do we have a current weekly zone in the same area yep so we'll see what's gonna happen here I doesn't matter what I think you know I was just gonna say well here's what I think is gonna happen it's not important, okay? 
all that ultimately matters is what does happen. So we'll leave it on that note. Listen, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Whoever you are, wherever you are, may God continue to richly bless you with his mercy and with his grace. And I'll see you at the bell. Remember this, there is no greater return on investment than to see a human life changed and given hope. As always, pray hard and trade safe. Any financial information discussed on this show is simply the opinion of our host, Dwayne Reeves, his co-hosts, and guests. To learn more about trading e-mini futures or to take a one-week free trial in our live trading room, call 1-866-928-3310. 866-928-3310. Information discussed on this radio program should not be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Always do your own due diligence and consult with a licensed securities broker or financial planner before making any investment decision. Hello and welcome to the mind of a trader. This is Steve Croft, the author Rosanna.